It's showtime, folks. Welcome in, Chase and Big Joe, Friday edition. You made it. We made it. Hope you're having a great day. He's Big Joe. I'm Chase McCabe. Dr. Crane, Nick Frazier on the ones and twos. Nick Keyser back there as well. Predators win 6-3 last night. Bridgestone Arena. Philip Forsberg has tied Matt Duchesne for the most goals in franchise history in a season. What's up, JoJo? I thought we couldn't stand Matt Duchesne. I didn't know he had the most goals in a season. Uh, I cannot stand Matt Duchesne, but uh, okay. we do. Yeah, he he, okay. he has that. He he has that record for a little while longer. Okay, I had no idea he had that record. So good for them. But good for the Preds last night. Big win and uh, ninety eighty six doesn't look good, but ninety two eighty four looks really good. The point differential between the Predators and the Blues. Yeah. So um, they win last night. The Blues pretty much done with their playoff hopes. The Predators, according to Money Puck, have a ninety nine point nine percent chance of Money making Puck. it. Money so, Puck. Yeah. So I feel pretty good about those odds. Um, you know, what's funny around here, you know, obviously we do a lot of planning and, and stuff. And so our fantastic sales team is like, hey, have they clinched? When are they going to clinch? Do we know when they're going to clinch? And I'm like, I, I don't really, I can't really give you that answer. I can only base it on points. But right. I think 99.9% is a pretty good Well, uh, there was some clinching going on before the Blues game. Uh, yesterday, correct? I mean, there, there was some clinching going on in the last five minutes of the Blues game. Yeah, because so, they started coming back, and then you know, all of a sudden, the Predators were like, "Let's close the door with some empty netters." Yeah, and then we went out. The, you and me it, it went to Chiefs last night. Eric Church's new bar, and yeah, God, we were out all night long. Fantastic! Wow, when he pulled you on stage, and I, I know, and you guys sang that one song, man. Woo! And his buddy Eric Chesterfield showed up. Yeah, too, so that well, was, I mean, so I'm I'm looking at the boss man. Eric Church and Eric Chesterfield <laughs> on the so stage awesome. at the same time. like, the, And I couldn't get my phone out to take a picture. I was stuck in the moment. So, well done. Shout out to our good friend Eric Church last night. What a time. What a time. Oh, Chief. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. We were stuck in a moment. We couldn't get out of it. Oh, it was crazy. You too. Yeah. Uh, so, I have a – you know, I'm feeling good today. All okay. right. So, uh-huh. let me – can I quickly tell you about my morning just sure. to, why I'm kind of in the yeah, man. You know, sometimes you just – you sleep good enough that you wake up that – Nothing's gonna bring you down. The dog was, <laughs> the, the dog was being a jerk. Is you know. He What's just, your dog's name? Sawyer. Sawyer. He was just you know rambunctious and everything, and you know just letting me know it. He's probably tired of your snoring as well. Yeah. So. Well, you know, he probably. I'm tired of his. So <laughs> <laughs> the feeling is mutual. So you know, I get ready and everything, and and it's Friday, and so a lot of times on Friday, I'll I'll hit the Starbucks, you know, and just kind of, will treat yourself. We've talked about this, but go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I saw something that made me laugh in inside Starbucks that probably would have made you laugh as both it was you when you were younger and also as a parent. Okay. Because it but it made me laugh because it reminded me of me when I was like seven or eight, whatever. You know, so there's a you order online and you go up to the counter and everything and they have stuff with your name on it, you pick it up and you leave, right? And so got my drink and I'm waiting on my food, and there's a lady with her two kids, and the kids are probably in the six to eight, nine range, something like that. All right. Girl and boy. The boy's the youngest. So the lady at Starbucks brings over a ton of food and sets it down. And what do all kids do when that happens? I mean, they just they dive in, right? Yeah. So the boy just runs up there, and he starts rummaging through everything. And what made me laugh is I just see – all I see is just this hand come in and grab him by the shoulder and pull yes. him back. Yes. <laughs> as, as my, and then the girl kind of starts looking. Mom kind of pulls her back, too. <laughs> yeah. And it just it reminded me so much of I was that way when I was a kid. And then it made me think, oh, I bet Joe's going to laugh at this because he probably had to do that with his kids. Well, no, that uh, did you call DCS? Because, you know, that's how we do things now. No, like, no, you know, no, we, no. That, that was good parenting. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we don't wait, wait around any longer for that. Well, good. Yeah, that's perfect. They so it made that. me laugh. And then I, um, you know, usually like I'm when I'm not on the air, I'm listening to our station. This part of what I do, part yep. of my job, and and always listen to Robbie and Rex on my way in. But this morning I was like, you know what? Just need some music. Yeah. And so I put on a little early two thousands pop mix. Yes. And let me tell you, I am just in a fantastic mood. Do we have it is that our music today, I hope? No. In, in honor of WrestleMania, we're going wrestling. Okay. Course. All right. So 
Um, but uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm just, and I was like, it was Jennifer Lopez, like Jenny from the Block, like it was stuff like that, and Petey Pablo. Whatever happened to Petey Pablo? Uh, I have never heard of that man in my life. You've never heard of it, him? No. Uh-uh. Oh, is he that was a, he was like a, a rapper in the early 2000s and just had a decision. You know Petey Pablo? Yeah. yeah. It yeah. was on my iPod. My brother had all these f- songs, and I just got inherited the same iCloud. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll get all his songs. He had that song like uh, Raise Up, you know, like North Carolina, go on and raise up, take your shirt off. You know that one? <laughs> I do not. Okay, well. No, you should to- I know that one? I don't know that yeah, one. Yeah, you should know that one. So, I don't know. That, I'm just in a... I'm in a random good mood this morning. Well, so I'm. Ex- I don't know any of this WrestleMania music, so I'm looking forward to it today. Yeah, I'm so going to be you. curious if you know any of this. Okay, well, good. I, I, I like that. So I'm glad your day's off to a good start. All right. So our question of the day, we're going to get right to. We got a packed show today for you today. Sean Henry at nine fifteen. Chris Sanders at ten. Correct. Yes. And then at ten thirty, Joe Piscopo. I am so excited you, for this. I have never <laughs> seen Joe. Now you were excited for Hojo. I was. And by the way. I had a ton of people walk up to me last night at the Preds game saying that they loved Hojo Howard Johnson. Oh, I mean, you could listen to those stories all and day long. And Booker T. So, yeah. uh, I had more people come up to me at the game last night talking about our show than I have ever. And well, good. that was just a thank you so much. That's for- what you get when you stand in the middle of the concourse with a shirt on that says, hey, talk to me. <laughs> Chase the Big Joe Show. No, that 1030 Joe Piscopo is going to be here. And look, for my generation, Joe Piscopo and Eddie Murphy on Saturday Night Live were just fantastic. Joe's coming to town for a big event at the Sinatra Bar on Sunday. He's also a Jersey guy. The Preds play the Devils on Sunday. So we might uh, little make a, nice a little time. wager with uh, Mr. Piscopo. He'll join us though at 1030. And I'm so excited. All right, the question of the day is, it's a non-sports question, but we really need your help. I was asked last night, and Dr. Crane, you can weigh in this as well, where the best meet and three in Nashville is or in Middle Tennessee? And my response was, I don't know because so many have closed down. But there's got to be four, five, six, seven that are still around that people go to. I need to know. I was – I just – you know, I love Nashville. I love Middle Tennessee. I had no answer for this person last night. I felt terrible. So 615-737-1025, tell us where the best meeting three is, but tell us why. That the, and if you, if you see a Cracker Barrel, Chase is going to come out in the parking lot and fight you, which Cracker Barrel's good. I get it. Uh, yeah, we love some Cracker Barrel, but yeah. not, not, not in this car. Yeah, so at meeting three, let us know. I, I, Chase, I don't know because everything's closed, so I need to know where it is. Well, so I said to you, I said one to you, and you go, I think it's closed, and, and it's, it's in fact open. It's reopened. Arnold's. Arnold's is okay. Good on Eighth Avenue. Arnold's Arnold's is like to me has always been the gold. Standard. But it was closing, correct? It was, okay. and I think it was one of. The, I don't know if it closed. A development and, that was going to buy the space. I don't think went through. Okay, so which good. allowed them yeah, to reopen. You know what? I'm glad. I'm yep. glad. I'm glad a development that was going to ruin a Nashville icon didn't didn't work out. Because you know what? We don't have enough developments around. Here. <laughs> right. As I'm looking at the screenshot, the uh, and Randy Cam shot from Channel Five on TV right now, and there's just. So much development yeah, going right. on. This was going to be another one of those developments that tried to tell me about this historic area <laughs> and make up a damn name. Like, right. This is called the the Nashville Concourse. Uh, it's a historic area from 1993. You, you know what my favorite is now? is uh, Somebody said, hey, they were going to meet for dinner in the Chestnut Hill area. And I said, I don't live in Boston. <laughs> True story. <laughs> And Chestnut Hill is down there by the old Greer Stadium, and that yeah, area. you're right. I'm like I have I my entire life that's never been referred to as Chestnut Hill ever. No, no, no. it was always down by the fairgrounds we- or down by the fairgrounds or Wedgwood. Yeah. Now, now we've added the Wedgwood Houston. A lot of people say Wedgwood Houston or uh, Wedge Ho or something. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not down with you. No, or whatever. it's it's Wedgwood. Yeah. Like yeah. And, and, like, I would refer to places, you know, uh, about their streets. But, like, we have Nashville Yards and we have, you know, what's the other one? that? Uh, oh, well, now it's Sobro. Sobro. Like, yeah, we call it Sobro. That was just Broadway. Uh, Berkshire or something downtown, too, as well. It's like, oh, meet me over in Berkshire. Right. Like, is that a shoe? Yeah. <laughs> I now, was like, what is that, a financial firm? Okay, so, like, you know, like, 8th Avenue, like, 
before you get to Zany, so just past, so down from Franklin Road and that that I'm was like Melrose. Out or in Melrose, yeah, Melrose, yeah. yes, yeah. Is it still Melrose or have we given it some stupid name now? I believe it's still Melrose. Okay, from what like, I that know was of. always Melrose. Yeah, like, that was the the Melrose area, and then and then down by Zany's. Right, you take eighth down by Zany's. Yep. Is that still Melrose or is that? I I don't know. That's a great question. Or is that more the Wedgwood? Because you're you're right there at. I do know that it's traffic and a lot of it, but that's oh, that, fine. Yeah, we're, that's, we're 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 you know. we're with that now. But that's the thing. So the best meet and three, some of those are starting to roll in now. Six one five seven three seven one zero two five, and just not Nashville. Wherever you're hearing this show, let us know where the best meet and three is because I you know I should know this and I had no clue. All right, so far we have Sweats best fried chicken. Uh, sweats is good. I'll go. I'll I'll give you that one. All right. Um, I'm see y'all are gonna make me hungry now. And this maybe you're picking you already had your forty eight dollars Starbucks. I what did. do you want? It was forty five. What else we got? Uh, Liz said, or Liz, Liz Good Goodlettsville is there a place called Liz? Maybe that's her name, Liz in Goodlettsville. So she's just saying Goodlettsville has the best meat and fruit. I, I don't know. Um, McHenry's and Murfreesboro Pike. McHenry's. Where exactly is that? On uh, is that towards town? I don't know. All right. Um, yeah, give us a name of a place. A lot of people are just saying spots, like Germantown or whatever. Give us a name. Yeah, I need a, we need the name. All right, so here we go. This is West from Hermitage on Arnold's. COVID almost screwed it up. They temporarily closed, but they're back and better than ever. There's one more place I'll send in when I think of the name. All right, thanks, Thank you, Wes. Wes. Um, Tesha's apron string in White House. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. We need more. Pl- I need it. Where big you Al's, got? Big Al's. That's a good one. Yeah, Big Al's, baby. Where's Big Al's? It's by Old St. Thomas Sports Park, actually. Yeah, it's over in like Metro Center. Is it? I don't know. I mean, we need. Uh, yeah, we I went there know. three weeks ago. Actually, very good. Got the Big Al's breakfast, two sunny side up eggs, mm. hash browns. Man, I'm getting myself. Okay, all the hungry. place in Goodles- Goodlettsville is called Liz's Restaurant. Okay, thank you, Shannon. Liz's restaurant, like it. All right, well done there. Yeah, right. we'll uh, we'll keep keep these coming throughout the show. Best meet and three in Nashville or Middle Tennessee area six one five seven three seven one zero two five. Coming up next, we'll talk to Sean Henry, the president or the CEO. I knew I was going to do that. The CEO of the Nashville Predators, Michelle Kennedy, is Madam President now. Sean will join us coming up next. Big win last night for the Predators. One zero two five one zero six three. The game.
Chase and Big Joe, 1025-1063, the game. WrestleMania weekend, so naturally I've taken over the music. All right, who's this? The tribal chief, Roman Reigns, will defend his title against Cody Rhodes in the main event Sunday night. Wait, I thought The Rock's doing this. Well, night one, Roman Reigns will tag team with The Rock to face Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins, and then if Rock and Roman win that match, then the championship match is under bloodline rules, which (laughs) means anything goes. Love it. And if Cody wins, or if Cody and Seth win that match, then the bloodline, including The Rock, is barred from ringside. All right. I got it now, buddy. Thank you. There you go. Let's bring in Sean Henry, the CEO of the Nashville Predators, who is on the line with us. Predators with a huge win last night, 6-3 to three against the St. Louis Blues. The magic number is now four points, and according to Money Puck, a 99.9% chance of making the playoffs. Sean, good morning. How are you? <laughs> What a lead-in. Oh, my gosh, guys. I know, I'm man. Supposed to hype people up for the weekend. I, I'm a wrestling guy, too. You know, I've been at WrestleMania twice. But, good golly, it was more exciting watching you guys eat the sausage and biscuits yesterday. <laughs> well, okay. What, what? I mean, what do, you, what do you want? You want me to cut a promo? Like, are we? What? Yes. Man, I want some pump music. I want to hear, like, I like it. I love it. Glorious. I want to hear Hail to the Chief something. My gosh. Okay. We'll work on it. Or I was trying to think of of something you know wrestling thing that, that worked for you, and I I went with Roman Reigns because he's a he's a leader, you know, and you're a leader. So he is a leader. Well, I'll tell you, the greatest WrestleMania ever was in Houston, watching Undertaker and uh, Heartbreak Kid. I was with my nine year old son, and he cried like a baby, recognizing it was the last match ever. It was oh, a good time. so that was twenty WrestleMania twenty six, I think. Yeah, oh nine, I think it was. Okay, nice. Very nice. I'll send you some pictures right now. Yeah, you can share them later. (laughs) Cool. What's what's going on, guys? Well, last night. What a win. What a win last night. Uh, You know, I've I've asked I asked Andrew Burnett about this uh, last week, but you know, from from your perspective, the the thing that I love that has happened during this stretch is you've seen a lot of secondary scoring. You've seen a lot of different guys step up. You know, Michael McCarron was one that scored last night, but. You know, when he, when he gets crunch time, you're looking at guys like Yossi, you're looking at guys like Forsberg, you're looking at guys like Soros. All three of them stepped up last night and helped this team win. Oh, well, there's no doubt. You know, you, you always want your, your, your stars, your big players, you know, to be your big players on, on, on the stages. But at the same time, you got to go up and down the, the roster. And, you know, back in October, November, a lot of people were talking about our second-day scoring, and you just knew it was going to come under Bruno's system. And, you know, the past two months, you've seen every single line roll. And I hate using first line, second line, fourth line, whatever it may be. Each one has a somewhat of a different role. But when they're all contributing and what their strengths are, it's magical. And then every once in a while, you know, I thought you want to see Phil fight all the time, but you see Phil fight last week. You see scoring coming from that, quote, unquote, third or fourth line. And uh, that's when some magic happens. And, and last night was fun. It sure was. We're talking to the chief bottle washer for the National Predators. His name is Sean Henry. Uh, Sean, I got this. Actually, I got a serious question. Uh, how do you guys balance Preds in the playoffs with Bridgestone schedule? I mean, do you make the Bridgestone schedule first and then the Preds around that? Because that's kind of be that would drive me crazy trying to figure everything out. He pawns that off on Kells. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are fortunate, and we, we literally have the very, very best in the business that books are building and, and really balances the, the schedule and the game of Jenga. But we have shows booked out, you know, two, three years, actually, in some cases. So what you got to look at is, you know, when you're looking at those dates and you have to look at what dates you're going to submit for the upcoming hockey season, which we normally submit in November, you know, the year before, um, you want a certain pattern. You know, we like playing those, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Um, you have to submit a few Sundays here and there. But you also want to balance it around the holidays. You know, when do you want the team home? When are they going to be on the road? and you build around CMAs and the SEC schedule that you only have every year. So you do that, submit about 70 dates, and then you start getting some back. But during the playoffs, we have a pretty simple philosophy. You just try to book shows uh, no greater than every other day, and this way the NHL schedule can pot into that. And then every once in a while, if you're, someone will call and say, look, we have you know this huge act. We need three dates in a row. We're going to do three shows. And uh, we'll do it and tell them, but it's conditional. If we have a playoff team, we have to relocate that date and uh, sometimes you know God smiles on the fools because we've only had to relocate two concerts the whole time I've been here wow. so it's, uh, it really is uh, you roll the dice a little bit 
Um, but it does work. Now, the league, the Steve House of Patriots, who does the scheduling, and his mentor was the guy that used to do the scheduling without computers for Major League Baseball, the NBA, and the NHL. It's fascinating to hear him talk about how they used to do it pre-computer. Oh, I it's, can... Uh, mm. Yeah, it's fun. It really is. And then David Poyle um, and he and Hotsey are you know, just tight, tight friends. But David's old buddy and uh, works for the Capitals actually helps us build the schedule at the league, believe it or not. So for 40 years, he's helping David Poyle build the best schedule possible. Well, that's cool. I would like for Chase and I to sit in on one of those meetings and help you guys build the best schedule. We'd have triple headers uh, same day for the Preds. <laughs> well, I'll let you know when it comes next. It is you fun. will. Uh, I know you got to ask this. I know you got to ask this question in the SEC tournament because they people ask me. I'm like, I don't know. It's like, you know, why don't just you know, you guys do such a great job hosting the SEC tournament. Why not host the NCAA tournament? And your good man Bill Wickett was like, we don't want our hockey team gone for a month. And I'm like, he's exactly right, right? Yeah, I mean, you really have to choose. And, you know, Chase and I have talked about this a few times, too. You know, I, I love all things March Madness. You know, the men's tournament, the women's tournament. And, uh, you know, but our first master is the Predators. And, you know, the, the building and the city thrives around the Predators. Everything else we fit on in there. But how fortunate are we to have the SEC tournament, you know, where you run, you know, from Wednesday through Sunday. And next year we're adding two, two more games into the uh, – the format on Wednesday, you know, for the NCAA tournament, as great as it is, you only have two days of basketball. Um, you're either Friday, Sunday, or Thursday, Saturday. Um, and a lot of times, you don't even know those, or not a lot of times, all the time, you don't even know those teams are until Sunday night or Monday morning. So sometimes you don't even sell those games out, believe it or not. Uh-oh. Oh, there he is. You. Okay, no. Uh, I thought we lost you, but no, you're there. Sean Henry is with us. Uh, here on the program. All right, so I learned something last night, and I always learn. I always love it when I learn something new. And maybe it's I should. Great day when you learn something new. No it doubt is. about that. I learned because the great Rebecca King was on the pregame show with Max and talking about hockey fights cancer. And of course, this is the second hockey fights cancer night of the year. There was another one, you know, earlier in the season, and I learned that the Predators have kind of started this trend and are the only ones that do it twice a year. And I think that is absolutely fantastic. And, you know, being completely vulnerable and serious with you, you know, I lost my dad to cancer a few years ago as someone that has been affected by it in, in a way that I, I never imagined. You have no idea how much I appreciate what you all do uh, with hockey fights, cancer. And so um, another fantastic night, it, it pulls at your heartstrings, no doubt. But I think it's a really important night that um, the NHL and the Predators do. Yeah, you know, we had over 17,000 people in the, in the building last night. And I think we had over 17,000 people whose lives have been turned upside down by cancer. I mean, I literally don't know a person on the planet that has not been you know, touched in an awful way by it. You know, my own father passed away, my mother-in-law. I'm sure Joe has bad stories, too. Um, so it is important to rally you know, our fans around such a great cause and, when you have a treasure like you know Vanderbilt in your backyard, we got to make sure that we're helping fund them for research, and then also letting some kids and families forget about the trouble, you know, for a few hours. And last night we had the youngest puck drop ever with an 18-month-old uh, beautiful little baby that was awesome. who just uh, entered remission. And then we did a reunion for a bone marrow transplant. You know, the first time they they met each other in person, which you know it, it's fun to celebrate, it's fun to cheer those kids on and the families on. At the same time, you know, I don't cry very often, but Twice a year, Rebecca King makes me cry, but uh, I am proud of the fact that we do too, and and uh, we really host one almost every night because every game night auction is dedicated to the 365 fund. Well, and I I thought Roman Yossi <laughs> was fantastic because you can tell he's a, a father of young children trying to uh, you know coax her along to drop the puck and, and help her. I thought that was just a cute moment too. It really was both he and Shen, you know, yeah. both being dads and just all around good guys. It was really one of those beautiful moments that I'm sure we're going to capture on video forever. And look back on this one and smile, and hopefully that little girl comes back in 20 years and uh, drops the puck again with a really nice story. Do you have your uh, tux ready for Thursday night, the annual wine festival? I can see you walking around uh, as a uh, sommelier. What do they call him, sommelier? I think what, you were right, actually. <laughs> the wine guy, yeah. Are, are you the wine guy. Next Thursday, it's the, the wine festival. It's a. Gr I've been in that event, Sean. That is well done by you guys. You know, it's a fun event, but uh, Joe, everything's a competition to me, so it's a wine tournament to me. <laughs> I'm in the office, everyone laughs, and uh, whoever gets the most corks wins, 
But it's one of those really, really fun nights where, you know, we get a chance to showcase, gosh, I don't even know, a couple hundred different wines and liquors and spirits. And uh, it, it's a fun, relaxed way to see a lot of our, you know, the best of Smashville hanging out together, toasting each other. But it is fun, and it really helps drive our overall efforts with the uh, foundation. Uh, my favorite is, you know, so many of our staff end up, you know, becoming pourers and some of the A's. And uh, I don't even know what that word means. I just yell, hey, the <laughs> glass is empty. Let's go. You know, I feel like uh, you know, 1400s banging my uh, goblet anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a fun night, and y'all do well with that. All right, now, Sean, coming up at 1030 on the show today, I- I'm excited for our guests, and you'll appreciate this. The great Joe Piscopo is going to join us at 1030 today. We grew up watching him, right, Saturday Night Live, him and Eddie Murphy? You know what? I love Joe Piscopo. My favorite movie, I know it's going to sound stupid, because I love Michael Keaton, too, is a movie yes. called Johnny Dangerously, and he was just the best in that, so... Tell him uh, we expect to see him at the game on Tuesday if he wants to hang around town. Uh, he is a funny, funny man. He's brought a lot of smiles to my face. Well, they play. He, he's from Jersey, and the Preds play. He's in town for a big event at Sinatra's Bar Sunday, and the Preds play the Devils Sunday. So we're going to make a little wager with Joe Piscopo. I hope you do. I'm not allowed to give any wagering advice or, or put anything down. But I promise you, you will not be disappointed in, in the outcome of what you're planning on doing, Joe. Good. Can you send me a jersey that says Piscopo in the back? <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I would, but I'd be so afraid I'd misspell it. And that's a word you don't want to misspell. You know? no. <laughs> right. no, it is not. Sean Henry is with us. Uh, also, Tuesday night, I know that's Pride Night against Winnipeg. And there's going to be a plaza party starting at 5 o'clock. Also, you can... Uh, uh, bid on some special Pride Night jerseys that the players have signed as well. Uh, another another fantastic night. Yeah, it is. And again, you know, we have 41 events a year, and we get a chance to you know celebrate so many different uh, groups of people. Make sure our game is as open as it can be. And I love when people say, you know, y'all means y'all. And uh, you know, it's just uh, another another fun night. Being able to shine a light on uh, maybe a group of people that weren't all, always going to feel so welcome in certain places. And I just love the fact that people feel good about our games and come together and uh, feel good and comfortable and uh, sense of belonging. Because that's what it is. We bring the community together. We get a chance to, for three hours, forget about whatever's going on outside and, you know, rally around this team and, and just enjoy each other. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so as we end this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a – some people might call this a hot take – but I, I just I feel good about it. I feel very, very confident about the prediction I'm going to make. So Philip Forsberg tied Matt Duchesne's record last night with 43 goals, which is the most in franchise history. I think we both believe he's going to break that uh, over the course of the next six games. But I'm going to take it a step further. I think he's got seven more goals in him this season. I think he hits 50. Well, I don't know why you're being so pessimistic with only seven more goals. I'm going to let him know. But, uh, you know, Big Chase thinks he only got seven in him. Uh, wherever he ends up, it's been a, a phenomenal year, you know, for Phil. Uh, whether he ends up with no more goals or 20 more goals this season or has two per game throughout the playoffs, we're seeing his game continue to elevate. And let's face it, no one thought that was possible. I mean, as good as he's been over the past you know, decade, what we're seeing is, is a guy that just continues to grow and grow and grow in all aspects of the game. So it's, uh, you know, the next, you know, five, ten years is going to be really exciting watching where he ends up for his career. But this year, he's been fun to watch. That whole line has been incredible oh, to watch. So fun. I, I'm, I'm, it's, Chase is worse than George Costanza asking Paul O'Neill for two homers. So, <laughs> <laughs> goodness. Could you hit two? Poor Phil's like Lou Gehrig in the hospital following Dave <laughs> Ruth. Okay, Joey, I'll get you three. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, Sean, appreciate it <laughs> as always. Uh, enjoy the weekend. I know you'll be watching WrestleMania and also the Predators against the Islanders and the Devils. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, I'll swing by your house. I can't afford the pay-per-view, so I'll be watching <laughs> from your front yard, peering hey, through the windows. So. Come on, Ricky Ricky, and I will pull up a chair for you. All right, guys. Hey, thanks so much. Have a great weekend. All you right, too. Buddy. Sean Henry, the Nashville Predators CEO, joining us here on the program. I do. I think Philip Forsberg gets to the 50-goal mark. He's got six games to do it, so obviously have to have a multi-goal game in there somewhere. But I hey, th- why not? I think he can do it. And here's the other one, too. He's at 87 points, so that's 13 from 100. I I don't <laughs> think that that's out of the realm of possibility for him either. 96 is the record that was Roman Yossi. I heard Robbie talking about this 
this morning. Right. I definitely could see him get 96 or 97. So you, you, they taught you subtraction at FRA. <laughs> they did. Basic math. Yeah, I was, I was good. Anything beyond that? Eh, uh, reset fine. our question for the break. Uh, our, our question of the day is, where is the best meet in three, either in Nashville or in Middle Tennessee? Yeah, I, I don't know. We will uh, go through some of your answers. Coming up next, Chase and Big Joe, 1025, 1063, the game.
yeah. The Texas Rattlesnake. Stone Cold Steve Austin. I want a beer now. I WrestleMania, know. that's our theme. You know this one? I do not know that. Really? I, I know. What, what was the Honky Tonk Man's one? Well, uh, the... He's the honky tonk man. You have that plan coming on your little uh, list no, it's later. Not, it's not on the list. Well, about Hulk song. I know Hulk song. I don't have Hulk song. Oh, come I on. tried to play like a little bit of current, a little bit of you know from the past. What's Ric Flair's uh, song into the ring? That's the 2001 Space Odyssey. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. I'm I'm learning, man. I only know Reno Riggins' song into the ring, and that was uh, a, sh- a, a arena of booze. Ring down <laughs> on my friend. It would be fun to have him on. He's great. He's yeah, got, we, we went to lunch with him one day, and he told stories. Right. He became, for like a year, he became Andre the Giant's little like assistant. And oh, so nice. Andre the Giant would make him go buy wine at places. <laughs> so, Reno Riggins, for those that may remember their, what, early 90, late 80s, early 90s yep. in the WWF, was basically what you call a jobber. He was the guy that would you know come out and – wrestle a star or something and you know get beat usually yeah but um was great i mean you had to have those guys so i sent you that he said he posted something today on facebook and some wrestler that was big in the night i don't I remember who it was was like seven feet tall and picked him up and just launched him and i know <laughs> i know y'all wrestling fake but that had to hurt i was hurt watching yeah. it i mean he launched reno across the ring onto his back and i was like oh my goodness but that's why we love it man uh i will uh in our last segment before birthdays we'll give my wrestlemania predictions we have to do it before that because we have joe piscopo at 10 30 30 yeah. no i know so before birthdays at oh okay okay we'll do yeah. that all right i like it uh all right our question of the day is best meet and three in nashville or middle tennessee McKendry's on murfreesboro pike is getting a ton of of votes i've never they, that's why I I'm think this. now I've people have described where it is so now I, i'm pretty sure i know where it is we're, we're gonna have to go try that that out uh douglas and company in cooperstown in cooperstown not cooperstown cooperstown is that up north i guess towards white house yeah maybe? okay um <clears throat> so let's see other ones grannies and greenbrier i like the alliteration there it's got to be good uh liz's and gulletsville's gotten a few votes um is Jack's on Broadway not still open? Yeah, it's still open. I thought I've, that was it's, it's barbecue. barbecue. But I mean, do people consider barbecue places meat and threes? Because you got you can have pork, you can no. have brisket, you can have chicken. I don't. I mean, it's kind of the same. Do you, Doctor Crane? You're a foodie. Not necessarily. I mean, I consider it, it to be a barbecue restaurant, but it's the same concept. It depends on the sides. If the sides kind of you know are a little closer to the menu of a meat and three than sure. Most are around here. I mean, yeah. like your green beans, your mashed potatoes. Your, your casserole. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you got like a chess pie or a pecan pie or something, yeah. then sure, maybe. I mean, it's a, it's a great gray area, Joe. Gray area. Uh, the read Rock this, likes pie. Read this one by Brian. This is interesting. Uh, let's see. I'm way down the list. He's towards the top. Uh, best meat and three, Osborne by right over by Belmont. It's the back of a grocery store. I love that. Oh, that's old school. I yeah, like, it is. I like that, too. Osborne by right by Belmont. Okay, we'll check that one out then. Pie Wagon was one that operated for 96 years. Rest in peace. That sounds good. Uh, Wendell Smith's on Charlotte, West Nashville. That's a good one. My side of town. Dan uh, and many others have voted for that one. Um, let's see. Cle- oh, the Clearview. Oh, that is a good place. Where's that? In Murfreesboro. I okay. went. I went there when I was in, in school. That's a fantastic place. It's kind of like a an Arnold's kind of thing, kind of a, the same same feel. Um, City Cafe on Spence Lane, Eleven and Pike. Viking Matt says that. Uh, Bishops and Franklin is a great meet and three quality food and fast service. Alan Franklin loved the show. Listen every day. Thank you, Al. Where, uh, I, where's Bishops? I've been there. Is now. That on the square? No, it's in Cool Springs. It's right across from Jim and Nick's, the Sam's Club. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. That's right. right. Thank there. you. It's kind of tucked away, but yeah. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of people are, are sending me Wendell Smith and, out in the, off of Charlotte. What about the City Cafe in Murfreesboro? Is it still open? Yep, it is. Okay, and there's one on there's Spence right on the Lane, square too as well. Another yeah, City Cafe. Yeah, that's. Are they the same thing? I don't know. That's what somebody. Thing. Sylvan Park Cafe. Didn't it close? Or is it closing? I don't know. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it may have. I, I remember that one. By the way, this McHenry's everybody's talking about used to be a jack-in-the-box. I remember where uh, this is now. So Where this is? is a fairly new place. 
I assume newer. so. Oh, the the building is definitely an old jack. So it's box. right across from the police headquarters. It should be. Yeah. Okay. All right. You guys yes. are great. I'm glad. Yes. I asked. Yes. Yes. Uh, Joe will appreciate this old dinner bell, which turned into Vittles. R.I.P. to both. Uh, rest in that place. Old is dinner bell. Donaldson? Yeah, it was fantastic. Then Vittles came in, and if you put that restaurant in now, as much as Donaldson has grown, uh, it'll do well. But uh, that, that one pulls at my heartstrings. Chef's Market in Goodlettsville. Great place. Thank you. Yes. Uh, dolls in East Nashville. Awesome meatloaf and fried chicken. I've gotten several for that one. Yeah. Dolls. Okay. I'm going to, I guess this is because I'm getting older. Yeah. But I always liked meatloaf, but it was never, it was one of those things that, like, right. yeah, whatever. Like, take it or leave it. I, that's my go to. Yeah. I love meatloaf. I, I never know what she's doing back there. <laughs> meatloaf. Ma! <laughs> Such meatloaf. A, such a good uh, meatloaf is. If it's what did she do? <laughs> if it's, uh, if it's yeah, if it's warm and and like old school, it's oh, perfect. Yeah. You know, it's one you pull out of like a, a box and put in the microwave. Pass. Yeah, um, there there are so many so many votes coming through here. Breaking bread in Smyrna. Uh, I'm told McHenry's is closed and now only caters. Oh, Thank boo. you, Chad Alsop. Love you, Chad. So McHenry's, uh, well, Man. we tried. Well, it was on Google. I recognized the building. Man, that stinks. Douglas and Company's gotten a few. Um, John Mann's place in Donaldson Plaza. <laughs> Don't read his text. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize who it was. I need to. I, I need to. <laughs> I need to put. This. <laughs> Don't read six eight zero nine. Just don't do it. Don't do it. Oh my! Can we just goodness. give out his phone number. No, <laughs> no, we do should that. do that. Uh, Barbara's and Franklin. I've never been there. Barbara's. I'm writing all these down, too, so thank you. Barbara's and Franklin. Uh, here, Middle Henry says, brotherly love. That's a great place. Over yeah, the nations. Fantastic. Fanta brotherly love is a fantastic place. Um, Wendell Smith, another one. Man, so many of these. Keep them coming. 615-737-1025. Oh, we got calls on this, too? Is that right? All right. Uh, Kenny the Mailman. Kenny, what's up? Hello, good dear friends. How what's are y'all? Fantastic. Peace. Two pieces of info for you right quick. Joe mentioned Stratton's last week, and it was so good. It's closed now. It was author John Grisham's favorite restaurant. Anytime he came to Nashville, he would drive all the way out Ashland there. Ashland City, eat. right? We met him, and he actually put it in the book, The Firm. The guy wow. stopped there going back and forth to Memphis. That's how good that was. Second of all, Joe. Yes, sir. You want to come eat with me at Centennial Boulevard Cafe. Because the food is excellent, but guess what? My uncle always watches over you when you're there. Oh. Okay. You know why? Because his picture's on the wall? I have the tallest uncle in Nashville. Is that a hint? Tallest uncle. Your uncle Shaq? <laughs> Almost. Will produce. There's a silo right next to Centennial Boulevard that's about 100 feet tall. Yeah. With the mural on the side of it. That is my uncle buddy. So. I did not know that. Silo man of Nashville. And it's not because he's famous or he was a mayor. He has volunteered at St. Luke's Center for over 50 years. Wow. And to honor him, they put him on the side of that to represent West Nashville. So you never know what you're going to learn, Mr. Dubin. <laughs> you're That's the best, Kenny. True. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, ty type in silo man and read the little story. You, it is really, really neat. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, Kenny. Appreciate it. Uh, real quick, Wes and Hermitage. Wes, what's up? Man, I uh, I had to share some uh, some hometown eatery with you guys. I'm not actually from Nashville. I've been here for about 13 years now. But um, there's a restaurant out in Manchester, Tennessee, on Paradise Street. And the funny thing is, is they're right across the street from a Cracker Barrel, and I know they hate it because it puts Cracker Barrel to shame. It's called Emma's Family Restaurant. It's a meet and three or a meet and four. If you've never had it, and you're just on 24 traveling. It's right off the interstate. You won't be upset. I'm telling you, it's cheap, and the food is just amazing. Say the name again. Emma's Family Restaurant. It's on Paradise Street, right across the street from Cracker Barrel in Manchester. Got it. Thank you, brother. Yes, sir. Thanks, Wes. Uh, real quick, the great Tommy Bryan, the Hall of Fame writer, says, Mike's Foodland in Lebanon, takeout only, fried chicken every day, plus two other meats. Broccoli Castle is amazing, and a location in Westmoreland, Mike's Foodland 
in Lebanon. These sponsors are great. You guys are wonderful. I, we've gotten a lot of people uh, that either at M- MTSU or Murfreesboro have said the Clear View. The Clear View is fantastic. Can't I forgot wrong. about that place. Can't go wrong. That is a good Where one. is it located again? I don't even remember. It's. I mean, it's close to campus. But it's yeah. not spelled. No, it's K-L-E-E-R-V-U. Okay. Clear View. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, but it's a good spot. By the way, Centennial Boulevard, that Kenny Moon. Yeah. Chicken fried steak with gravy on top. Ooh, it's the best steak in town. <laughs> I go there once a week when I'm dropping off all the guideposts to Mr. Plaster over at Litzkim. <laughs> so I go over to Litzkim and I say, Mr. Plaster, are you here? And they say, Kenny, he don't work here anymore. And I'm like, well, where does he work? So I go over to Belmont and they're like, he's not here either. <laughs> so then I go across town to that little radio station and say, he's been gone for about 10 years. <laughs> And I'm like, Mr. Plaster, I got your guideposts. <laughs> I don't know where they are. So, Mr. Plaster, if you're listening out there somewhere, I'll, I'll meet you over at McGugan Center today with your guideposts. Uh, I don't know what to do with you. Sometimes. And we can go walk the track over to Lipskin. I don't mind at all. Uh, Kitty, I, I, I'll I slap him for you. <laughs> uh, it's the Chasing Big Joe show here on a Friday, brought to you by Regal Realty Group. Really have enjoyed having Regal Realty Group on board with us. They have been uh, fantastic and appreciate them. We'll get into the Titans coming up next. Got a few thoughts on them before Chris Sanders joins the show. Chasing Big Joe, 1025, 106 for the game. All right, ESPN Bet. That is my go-to sports book, and it has been for uh, a long time. I've been telling you about ESPN Bet, and right now, new customers, if you make any type of sports book bet, you'll get a hundred dollars in bonus bets for making that sports book bet. And ESPN Bet has it all, including offers and promotions from Scott Van Pelt and Stephen A. Smith, from playoff intensity to getting on the links and out to the ballpark. There's no better time to be a sports fan. So get ESPN Bet today. What a play. You must be 21 years or older and in Tennessee. For problem gambling support, call or text the Tennessee Red Line at 800-889-9789. Terms and conditions apply. See app for details.
The final boss, The Rock. Going back to his old Hollywood rock theme. Chasing Big Joe, 1025, 1063, the game. In honor of WrestleMania. Going with some wrestling themes. Is it tonight? No, it's, well, SmackDown's tonight. The Hall of Fame's tonight. Night One's tomorrow. There's also uh, NXT, which is like their development league. Yep. Uh, Their stand and deliver show is tomorrow during the day. WrestleMania night one tomorrow night, and then night two is Sunday. What What's the biggest night? Uh, they're both, I mean, tomorrow night you get The Rock, so that's pretty big. And then Sunday night's the main, you know, the main event. Is that at uh, Lincoln Financial Field? Yep. Is Jason Kelsey going to do something in this, you think? He's got to, That's right? the rumor. Come out and pound The Rock's face in? Uh, that would be nice. Yeah, that would be cool. I, I don't know exactly what he's going to do, but I know that he's going to do something. What if... Kelsey, Jason Kelsey comes out, right? He's beating The Rock up. And then somebody comes out and helps The Rock, beats up Kelsey. Then Travis comes out. <laughs> and then Taylor Swift comes in on a zip line. <laughs> that would to be the awesome. Ring. And then she kicks everybody's tail, and then they fly out together. Yeah, I, I would I would sign up for that. That Wouldn't would be, be very cold. That's yeah, what I'm thinking. I mean, they cover the ring, but yeah, oh, okay. I mean. But they did the, they've done it in New York and – Everything. It's going to be here in a few years. When they get the new stadium built, it'll be here. And Is this the one awesome. last year that was in SoFi? Yeah. Okay. So they've been... I didn't like that. It's too much light. Yeah, it was bright. The bright lights of Hollywood. Um, they've done it at at um, Tampa. Giant Stadium. It, they've done it twice there at um, whatever it's called now. MetLife? MetLife. Um, <coughs> they were at Jerry's World a couple years ago. All right. They've done it a couple times there. Uh, New Orleans, I go to the Superdome a lot. When I went, it was at the Superdome. I remember one of the first ones, the Silverdome, was yeah, that Andre was the Giant. WrestleMania Hulk- 3. Okay. What was the first one? Uh, Madison Square Garden. Okay. The funny thing about that, so when I went to WrestleMania 30 in the, in the Superdome, Hulk Hogan comes out and does this like welcome to WrestleMania kind of thing because it's the 30th one. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, let me tell you something, brother. Hulkamania is running wild, and I'm just so glad to be in New Orleans in the Silver Dome, brother. <laughs> and and he kept he kept saying it like he kept accidentally saying Silver Dome, and so the fans start chanting, "We're the Super Dome," and he like hears it and he goes, "Oh, brothers, I'm sorry, the Super Dome." And so then the Rock and Stone Cold came out because they were going to be a part of it, and they both kept saying like making fun of him. Oh goodness, <laughs> it was so awesome. What year would this be? This was, it was 10 years ago, so it was 2014. Okay. Uh, it was fun. I went – that's the only time I've been to New Orleans. I have never had a worse hangover in my life. Every, Bourbon Street bites. Every time you go to New Orleans, it takes six months off your it life. It took six years off my <laughs> life. I, I have never I have never hurt that bad in my life. <laughs> like, I, we get there, and so, you know, I'm 26 years old at the time, so I'm ready to go – yeah, you yeah, know. woo! And uh, and I'm with Jeremy Benefield, who doesn't drink, so he's like, "I'll drive." Like, you go, you have fun or whatever. We hit Bourbon Street the first night. We had driven all the way, hit Bourbon Street the first night, and I'm drinking hurricanes and grenades and like mixing liquors <laughs> and like all this stuff, just stupid, dumb, stupid, going bar to bar on Bourbon. And I had never That's been all right. I had never been to a place where, like, you could just walk up to the window and get a drink and, you know, b- go wherever. It's an amazing place. And I think we were there for two and a half, three hours, something like that. I don't remember. I, and I – look, I'm pretty good. I don't black out. Like, I – Right. Things get fuzzy after a few hours a, a, that night. And, you know, and, of course, I'm like – he's he's like, are you going to be okay? I'm like, ah, I'll be fine. I'm good. I'll bounce back. I wake up the next morning and – I'm like death. Like I, 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 my head hurt. You still got both your kidneys? Yeah. yeah, I think so. That's a successful night. (laughs) Well done. I had, I, I woke up, I had my wallet, I had my phone. Like, so, you know, it was good. Just not your sanity. No. Look, we've all, all done that on Bourbon Street. So you had to be indoctrinated in the, the first time and there you were. Well, I know I want to go back. Like I haven't been in a while, but. 
Uh, yeah, that's people have asked me, what's the worst hangover you've ever had in New Orleans? <laughs> 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 Easy. Coming up next, we'll talk to our man Chris Sanders, forever Titans wide receiver. Get into all things Titans with him here on the Chase of Big Joe Show, 1025-1063 The Game.
Chasing Big Joe, 1025-1063, the game, hour number two here on this Friday, having a lot of fun this morning. Speaking of fun, let's bring in one of our favorites, forever Titans <laughs> wide receiver, Chris Sanders, on the line with us. What's up, Chris? Man, what's going on? You put a little stank on it, uh, forever. You put forever. a little stank on it. That was pretty forever, good. Ever, <laughs> ever? Always. How y'all doing, man? How's y'all's weekend? Oh, hey, I'm ready for the weekend. Uh, yeah, me but too. Doing fantastic. You know, so I'm a big wrestling guy, and this is what? this is a WrestleMania weekend. So this is. Is it a real wrestling or wrestling? Is it the wrestling. one where you're doing a, a singlet or are you y'all throwing chairs? It's a uh, both, but okay. it's <laughs> yeah, it's 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 wrestling. But I, I'm wrestling. looking forward to it. There we for go. Sure. <laughs> Uh, yes. Stephon Diggs, now a member Ooh, of the AFC South, as he has been acquired by the Houston Texans, and uh, I'm interested by this move. And then they've they've now knocked off three years of the contract, so basically yeah. it's a one year deal yeah. for him to come in here and, and be with C.J. Stroud in that group. What what do you think of the move, and what do you think Diggs can bring to the Texans? Man, I mean they got a wealth of, uh, of good guys on that team. I mean look at they got Tank Dale, they got Nico Collins. Both of them combined with 15 touchdowns. So when you have a, a Stephon Diggs coming in, coming in, I mean, it's just another threat to that receiver room. When, when the Tennessee Titans, you know, signed those other couple of receivers, um, I thought their receiver room was really, really good. But now you look at the, uh, the Houston Texans, I mean, it is absolutely incredible. I know everybody's going to talk about that he's a, a cancer in the locker room, he's a cancer in this and cancer in that. Okay, I understand that. But he still has a wealth of talent. He still can run routes, and he can still make plays for your quarterback. Yeah, and and I that was my next question. I mean, look, he's a guy that you could tell yeah. that him and Josh yeah. Allen something went wrong there. That yeah. the the, yeah. the relationship had soured. Uh, he wasn't getting the ball a lot. He he certainly would pout about that. And you know, I get it. That there are players that that happens to. That you know they they want every, they want the ball. Give me the ball. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I'm sure you were that way at times. Derek yeah. was that way. I mean, like everybody goes through that. But is it a concern that? Yeah of how his attitude could be that how that affects a young locker room like they have in Houston. I just think that if I'm the head coach of the Texas, Amico Ryan, he's, who's a great, you know, head coach in the league. The one thing I would, I wouldn't talk about X and O's. I wouldn't talk about, you know, wide receiver. I wouldn't even talk about the quarterback. I'm going to, I would tell, I'll sit him down and say, you know what? I need you to be a good fit for this team. I need you to be a good locker room guy. I need you to help CJ Stroud. I need you to help these young wide receivers to help them get to where they, where they need to get. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, he, he has a clean slate. And I know everybody makes mistakes and everybody makes wrong choices sometimes, but he's got to understand this. That this might be your your last rodeo. I mean, because you're getting older in age. I mean, you're not as fast. You still can run routes. You can still get open. But this is an opportunity to where if he goes down to the Texans and has a phenomenal year, with with all those three years gone, he can have a big payday somewhere. So he understands that. Well, he's walking into a situation. His his reputation is going to precede him. And I ask right. you this because. 1998, you guys welcome Yancey Thigpen. I mean, yeah. he didn't have that reputation, but yeah. here's a guy who comes in making more money than all you other guys combined and everything. How was that acclimation project uh, fit in with him? He fits yeah. in with you guys. What was all that like? No, it, it was okay because it, it, what, what happened when they signed that year, they brought Kevin Dyson in, they brought Yancey Thigpen in. It made me better, you know what I'm saying? And, and don't get me wrong, I want the ball. I want to make plays because the first couple of years I was a starter, and automatically when they bring those two guys in, I'm number three. So instead of getting pissed, instead of getting mad, I chose to get better. I, I made every play. I made every catch. I tried to run the routes of uh, the best of my capability. So now you got a situation with Diggs. He's just going to make everybody better, and I think that's going to be a good situation. Does anyone ever hear from Yancey Thigpen anymore? I don't know. I, I, don't, I think he's on a kickball league. <laughs> He might be. <laughs> no, he might be. No, he was a good player, man. I mean, he was a really he wasn't as fast, but he was just a really smart, savvy player that could make plays downfield. I heard one time he had a twenty five thousand dollar white fur coat. Oh my! It was awful. And a guy like a walked up with a uh, sharpie to sign an autograph, and Yancey <laughs> smacked it out of his hand because he thought the sharpie. Now, is this a uh, true? I don't know if you were there or not, but it makes it was me at laugh. The Super Bowl. It was. Yeah, he had on a lo he had on a, a white mink. It looked like it was a squirrel. I was like, "What is this?" <laughs> what is <laughs> like, this? He's, got, he's got a big old squirrel on. I'm like, "What is this?" Chris says, "I've got a ferret from Walmart jacket." You want to don't get away <laughs> no, from me on this? I, no, I had a starter's jacket on. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. Uh, no, but I, you know, you're yeah. right. If he comes in and you know and shuts his mouth and plays good, yeah. and then he can bounce out of there. I just, you know, Houston's just loading yeah. up, Chris. I mean, now, oh my God. Ravens, Chiefs, and the Texans. Jeez. But that's what you do when you spend money. 
Yeah, I mean, you do want to spend money because if you look at the league that, that's kind of going on right now, it's not about winning next year. It's not about winning two years from now. Everybody wants to win now, and everybody's kind of following that situation that happened with the Rams. The Rams loaded up with the quarterback. They loaded up with receivers. They loaded up with linemen. They loaded up with defensive guys, and they won the Super Bowl. Then now we blow it up because we just won it. So everybody's trying to follow that philosophy. Let's load up. Let's load up. But I tell you one thing, the Texans and the Ravens and the Titans are doing some big, big things. I commend those three teams. All right, so I want you to uh, you know, close your eyes and imagine. All right. three, okay, stay close. Three weeks from last night, you're sitting at Twin Peaks in Madison with <laughs> Derek Mason and Jared Stillman. Yes. And Roger Goodell comes walking across the stage oh. <laughs> and says, with the seventh pick in the 2024 NFL draft. The Tennessee Titans select Caleb Farley. <laughs> well, they've done that already. Wide receiver. Oh, you talking Malik. about now? Yeah, I'm talking about now. Oh, I'm talking, talking about, about three weeks from last night. That's the draft. Okay. Yeah. okay. And Roger Goodell says the Tennessee Titans select wide receiver Malik Neighbors, LSU. Ooh. What do you think the reaction of the fans in that that place and all and you all at the table would be? Man, they will lose their mind. It'll be like, oh my gosh! I will. I wish Jared would have, he was there when you asked that question. He would probably lose his mind. I mean, he's starting to lose a little bit of his hair now. He, he'll get a comb over. But man, he would just, he would just go crazy because look, look at the reason why we'll go crazy is because look at the receiver room that the Tennessee Titans have now. I mean, you got Calvin Ridley, you got Burks, you got you got some other guys that can play. So now you add them to to that to that Tennessee Titans roster, a guy that's big, physical from LSU that can make plays downfield. I mean, you you're talking about a quarterback that's going to be really, 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 really excited, and that's Will Levis because man, you got some playmakers on the perimeter. Do you think that whether they take, I don't think they're taking a receiver at seven. I, I, do, I do think it's going to be Joe Alt, but yep. if they take a receiver you know, somewhere in the top 100 picks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for Traylon Burks? Do you think that they look at trading him after the draft, or do you think they want to say, hey, you know what, yeah. let's see what he's got with this new coaching staff? I just think that you still want to see what he's got because, you know, even though you're bringing in different wide receivers, I know they brought in Calvin Ridley, and I know they got Hop, but you bring in another receiver, it's just going to make – Burks even better. And the reason why I say be better is because he's going to work hard. He's going to try everything to stay healthy. Because I remember, just like you said in 1998, when they brought Kevin, uh, Kevin Dyson in the first round, they got Yancey Thigpen, and they brought some other receivers in. You know, it made me better because I paid attention to details. I studied film more. So instead of me having a sour face and sour at the coaches and sour at the general manager, uh, Floyd Reese Rest, so who I love very much, instead of getting sour at them, I just mastered my craft. I, I focused on routes. I went back and watched film on what did I need to do better. So the same thing with, with Traylon Burks, with br bring another guy and bring in two or three more guys. That's going to make me work even harder. I'm gonna, I said this to myself, and I'll never forget this because I was a little upset. I drove up to the facility, and I sat in the parking lot and with tears in my eyes. I said, I'm going to play so well that they have to play me. And that's the attitude that Trading Burks needs to have. Not that they're mad at the organization, not that they're mad at them drafting wide receivers, but I'm going to play so well that you're going to have to play me. And, and, I, and Alan Lowry said what? what? What, to me? Yeah. Oh, man, I, I didn't tell nobody. I, I, I just said that to myself. Okay. You know, and, and I think who was the wide No, it was Steve Walters was the, uh, the, uh, the wide receiver coach. But he even noticed the difference. He even saw, like, okay, this dude's not playing around. Because I remember when they, when they brought uh, those guys in, in in the preseason, I scored like three or four touchdowns in the preseason because I wasn't playing around. So, listen, this is what Trillian Burks needs to do is go in there. I don't care if they sign 70 wide receivers. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be the guy that you can depend on. Because, look, I've been looking at his Instagram pages. I've been looking at, um, you know, his, his, his Facebook page. There's a different look in this cat's eye. He's not complaining. He's saying, you know what, I understand you got Kevin. Really. I understand you got Hop. I understand that you're going to get another receiver in the draft. But guess what? I'm still here, and I'm going to go get this thing. There's a different look. Oh, absolutely. And also, if I'm a Titans fan, I don't care, Stephon Diggs, because now you got two great cornerbacks oh my God. that you plug and play. I'm like, all right, bring it on. I mean, you, you <laughs> want to play against top competition. Now you yes. got two corners. like, all Ooh. right, I'll cover you. I'm not worried about this. So if I'm a Titans fan, I don't care. Straight dogs. They, I mean, when I say them dogs, are straight, them guys are good. Awuzie and uh, and uh, Sneed. Look at let me let me break oh, it down. Oh, they're dogs. They're dogs. But look at the receivers that the Tennessee Titans are going to have to face this year. Justin Jefferson, 
uh, Jamar Chase, uh, Stephon Diggs, Terry McLernan, uh, Garrett Wilson, DJ Moore, Christian Watson, Curtis Samuel, Quentin Johnson, uh, St. Brown, 10 touchdowns, Nico Collins, Tank Dales. You listen, and, and I got to give credit to TD because he gave me that. He gave me that list. Uh, he gave me the list. So you're you're you better get some corners in here. You got a woozy a and you got Snead. And the reason why I love Snead is because he's gonna choke somebody at the line of scrimmage. He, I mean, he's gonna put his paws on them and he's gonna choke them just like what he did to Tyreek Hill and just like what he did to AJ Brown. He has an attitude that brings that oomph to it. So when you have a guy that has that oomph to it, that you want to fight in practice, that you want to fight in the game. And then you got a Woozy on the other side. Then you got Elijah Mould, and, and and then you got you know you got Hooker. This can be one of the best secondaries in the league. Yeah, I mean where they are right now to where they were January fifteenth is night yeah. and day. Night and you know you know what the secondary reminds me of in nineteen ninety five when I got drafted. I, I think we had the craziest secondary in America. We had Chris Dishman, Daryl Lewis, Blaine Bishop, Steve Jackson, the defensive back coach for the Tennessee Titans, and Marcus Robinson. Dogs fighting every yeah. practice. I was like, if I can beat them, I can beat anybody. Look at the secondary that the Tennessee Titans have now. Sneed, Awuzie, McCrary, Hooker, Elijah Moden. Guys that want to fight every single play, and that's exactly what Denar Wilson wants as a defensive coordinator. I'm going to tell you this. Listening to, to LeJarrius Sneed on, on oh. Monday or whatever it was, when not only his press conference, but when he came on in the midday show, and look, you you got to ask about it. I, I know yeah. – I know he doesn't want to talk about it, but yeah. the knees kept getting brought up, and he kept getting more pissed off every time they got brought up. I'm like, all right, I like that. Use that. Use that energy. Yeah, because he he's got, he wants to prove that y- y'all can talk about my knees and you can talk about all this stuff, but I'm going to come in here and make plays. And here's what I want people to understand. Every you know, people are saying stuff about his knees, whatever, whatever. You better believe that Rand Carthaw, you better believe that Brian Callahan, you better believe that this organization did their homework to make sure he was okay because you're not going to pay – a guy that much money if you have concerns about his knee. I mean, but yeah. here's the deal. Even if another guy that they brought in had no health concerns, you're still rolling the dice because they got their one play from being hurt. So it's the exact same thing. Yeah, no doubt about it. Chris, appreciate it as always. <laughs> always <laughs> enjoy you. these and love talking to you. Hope hey. you have a great weekend. Love you guys so much. Thank you, guys. Absolutely. Chris Sanders, forever Titans or forever Titans wide receiver joining us here on the show. Um, I don't want to – I'm not going to say who it is yet. But I think I just booked somebody for next Thursday that is going to be freaking awesome. Uh, we just had Chris Sanders, so it's hard we to did. top that. We did, and we have Joe Piscopo in about 15 minutes. Oh, yeah, we do. And you're excited. But but if this goes through, and I think it's going to, I'm going to be really excited is about it. Is it Joe Namath? You, you uh, do that for me? No, you, it's, you, not, it's not Joe Namath. Damn it. All right. Is it, will I it's be as some, happy? Maybe. I mean, it's somebody oh, that was pretty famous in the – 80s and early 90s. Oh, okay. All right. So. Not oh. sure. You might have to change your pants after hearing this, Joe. I don't oh, know. yeah. No, I'm I'm, I'm pretty pumped. Don't have to. Wear the pins during the show. <laughs> don't have to leave. That's what that smell is. Anyway, uh, Jason Big Joe. That's rude. You know, one time I did a show with Willie Donnick for five hours and he never moved. Not one time. And I'm like, Willie, are you a camel? <laughs> he never moved. He never got up for five hours. I don't know why we're doing a five-hour show. I'll never forget it, though. He never moved. He never did nothing. Set here. Five hours. He's a camel. He is. Uh, the NCAA tournament wraps up this weekend. Coverage brought to you by Toyota. Ready, set, go. Get your Toyota today at toyota.com. Chasing Big Joe presented by Regal Realty Group, 1025-1063, the game.
The best there is, the best there was, and the best that there ever will be. Chasing Big Joe, 1025, 106.3 The Game. I let Dr. Crane pick one. He went with Brett the Hitman Hart. I like it. That's good. That's very, very good. Thank well you. Well done. What would, what would yours be, Chase? Like, came what, out. Well, I, I always use like Triple H, so time to play the game. Okay. By Motorhead. Time to play the game. So that's a funny story. There's like a um, documentary that he's in, and he's talking about in like middle of 2001, he turns heel, meaning the bad guy. And so they redid his, they wanted to redo his theme and make it, you know, kind of fit the character and everything. And he had already been the game. And, and so they, they kind of go through different things with his music and, um, and he's like describing to Jim Johnston who did all the music for WWE at the time. He's like, no, I want it heavier. Like, you know, and he kept saying like, you know, something like motorhead, like, you know, something like motorhead would do. And finally he knew Lemmy from motorhead finally goes, why don't I just get Motorhead to do it? And they're like, yeah, do that. <laughs> and so he called Lemmy. Nice. Lemmy Kilmeister and said, hey, will you guys do my theme? And he's like, yeah, let's do it. And then they recorded That's how it. they came. Okay. Yeah. So the game by Motorhead. And he ended up doing that one. Motorhead did um, Evolution, which was a group that Triple H was in, did their theme, Line in the Sand. And then he did the King of Kings, which was another one for Triple H. So. Well done. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Good to know, you know, a band. You're watching, uh, you can be glued to the TV Saturday, Sunday? Yeah. Yeah. Um, going to a party in Murfreesboro. Uh, oh. And so. Ricky I, know about this? Yeah, Ricky's going. Okay. Uh, and, but we have requested that there has to be a, a, de- a dedicated uh, either iPad or TV to WrestleMania. And if so, there's not. Then I won't go. <laughs> we'll do the old Irish goodbye. I'll do the Irish goodbye, but right. no, they, they, we'll be good. Is All this right. Peacock or Netflix? Peacock. Okay, so it's okay. yeah. So so it's, it's not pay per view. No. Okay. No. But it used to be pay per view. Uh, it used to be. Now okay. it's Peacock. All right. So. Sean Henry just said that because he wants to hang out with Chase on the weekends. Yeah, yeah that's it fine. makes sense. Hey, jokes okay. on Sean. Chase is at home. He's yeah. down in Murfreesboro. I'll be in Burr. In the Burr. I guess what? the back door's open. I don't know. Uh, but, easy. <laughs> Just saying, a lot of people leave their back doors unlocked. It's not a good thing to have. Oh. Uh, let's go back to our meet and three <laughs> discussion. Best meet and three in uh, Nashville. Dr. Crane or... wants everybody to lock their back doors. All right. Please lock your back doors. Dr. Crane, that's your PSA for today. Yeah, because there are a lot of people that have Amazon packages that get yep. stolen. And yeah. Don't keep your back door closed. Dr. Crane's, that's his PSA on Friday. He's heading to the weekend. We'll do a Dr. Crane 15 second PSA. Lock your back doors. All right, cool. I have a real PSA, but I'm just going to keep it to myself. Okay. All right. Probably best. It it's is. about donuts. But <laughs> okay. That's all I'm going to say. Go. What's our question? Can you reset that, please? Uh, I was asked yesterday what's the best meet in three in Nashville, Middle Tennessee, and I didn't have an answer because I think so many places have closed, and now you guys have been fantastic sending us all these meet in three, 615-737-1025, where they are. we got a lot for Wendell Smith. we got a lot for Clearview down in Murmur, uh Sweats, and what's the other one we got for? Uh, McHenry's. McHenry's, yes. And then Dolls in East Nashville. And then a lot of votes for brotherly love over in uh, the nations over there as well. So, well done, everybody. Thank you. Keep them coming in. This is good. The, these are great. Uh, these have been fantastic. Uh, clear again. Clearview gets a ton, um, and then and then we get uh, everybody voting for wrestling themes, which is fa- fantastic. Good. Got Arnold's. Arnold's is good. <laughs> 1652, open back doors and meeting threes. What a transition. Woo-wee. <laughs> we Got to find out about your meeting threes and keep that's, the back door locked. That's right. All right, Joe, who's next? You're excited about this. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we grew up watching Joe Piscopo is going to join the show. Uh, he's coming to town for a big event. We'll talk about why he's coming to Nashville this weekend. And plus, we'll walk down memory lane. And uh, I'm really I'm, I'm really excited for this. So stay tuned. Joe Piscopo is coming up next. Chasing Big Joe, 1025-1063, the game.
Chasing Big Joe, 1025, 1063, the game here on this Friday. Joe, I'm going to let you do the honors. I know how excited you are about our next guest. I thought you were. You no, know, I'm oh, letting you do all it. All right, yeah. I am so excited about this. Look, I grew up watching this, this gentleman on, on TV. Uh, I, I still say he saved Saturday Night Live, him and Eddie Murphy. He's coming to town this weekend for a big event. Welcome to the Chase and Big Joe Show, the legend himself, Mr. Joe Piscopo. Joe, good morning. How are you? Joe, how you doing, man? Hey, I, we just had an earthquake in New Jersey, and you're, get, you're getting it live. I swear to goodness gracious. I what? Don't think you saw this. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm saying I'm getting ready to talk to you guys. And, and Joe and uh, Chase, uh, all the best to you guys. we got a lot to talk about. Have a great weekend. But then I'm sitting around waiting to, for you guys to call, and, and, the, and the, I got an earthquake in New Jersey. I don't go to L.A., so I don't have the earthquakes. I come home. we got tolls, taxes. What exit? And now I'm in an earthquake in New Jersey. <laughs> Are you okay? That's the big question. Grace of God, you know what? I swear to goodness, where I'm talking to you from now is Hunterdon County, New Jersey, and the epicenter was right here, down the, literally down the road, a couple miles. And it, it was, you know, and I was in the 6.7 uh, earthquake, the Northridge quake in L.A. Oh. That was bad. But this was stronger and intense. You know, everything with an attitude in New Jersey, including the earthquake. You know? <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> well, we're glad you're okay. We hope everybody up there in Jersey and New York is okay. All right, so, Joe, yes, you're coming sir. to town this weekend. Before we get into yes, your sir. great career, tell us why you're coming to town this weekend. Oh, we're so excited, uh, Joe. Thank you for taking the time and allowing us to chat about it. You know, it, there's a great club in town in Nashville, the Sinatra Barn and Lounge, legendary. And it's, uh, we're celebrating the, the one-year anniversary of the, uh, of the lounge with Mr. Bill Miller. Tina Sinatra is going to be there. Uh, a lot of the folks from the Sinatra uh, organization are going to be there. And it is going to be a great bash. I don't know if you've been down there, but it's going to be uh, Saturday night around 7 o'clock. We're going to kick it off, and we're going to do performances. We're going to – I'm going to – actually, yes, I'm going to do a little bit of New York, New York. Right in the middle of Nashville, Tennessee, baby. Come on now. Come I on. I love it. We, you know, I go back to watch your great great clips in the '80s doing Frank Sinatra. Did you ever hear from Mr. Sinatra about your impressions? Yeah, I did, man. It was great because I when I before I did him on on Saturday Night Live, and um, it was I wrote a letter to him first before I did it because I did the impression uh, at the Improvisation Comedy Club, Joe. Right, and then I took it to SNL. And then they kept telling me at Saturday Night Live, they said, Joe, we need you to do that Sinatra impression that you do. And I kept saying, I ain't going to do it because, you know, it was all about my dad. Look, I'm Italian, man. And, you know, it's all about respect, you know. And I didn't want to – and it was, it was about respect to my dad, respect to Mr. Sinatra. But, the, the, you know, we kind of needed to get on our feet at the time because we replaced the original cast, that, which is not easy. It wasn't easy, man. People forget about how tough it was to replace Gilda Radner. And 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 Belushi and Aykroyd and Chevy Chase, that was our cast. You guys were you guys were babies, man. But we went in and we had to come up with stuff. So they said, Joe, do that Frank Sinatra thing you do. And I went, oh, all right, hang on a second. I wrote a letter and I and I sent it to Mr. Sinatra's attorney, saying, done with respect. This is we're just doing a satire show. If it offends you in any way, sir. I'll, I'll cease and desist immediately, you know, <laughs> and, and, you, you know what I mean? And, and wasn't that a fear? It was just it was all about an Italian American, North Jersey respect, you know? So, so I never heard from him. And then, and then, and we did one thing and then, and I had fun with the character. I mean, we had a lot of fun with the character and, and I never heard. Then I got invited to the Friars club, uh, a roast of Dean Martin and, I, and Mr. S Frank Sinatra was a master of ceremonies. Oh. And then I knew it was okay because I got invited. And I did Frank Sinatra to Frank Sinatra. I did an impression <laughs> of it. I know, I know. I know, man. And I'm still standing, brother. I'm still standing. He <laughs> loved it. Thank God. Thank God. You know? Crazy, man. Crazy. Joe, Joe Piscopo is with us. So when you, you were talking about the everything with Saturday Night Live and the cast, you know, changing yeah. and – you yeah, and Eddie yeah. are the only ones that, that are kept when Dick Ebersol takes over. What yeah. was kind of going through your mind of not only like, okay, hey, cool, I, I'm still here, still have a job, but also the yeah, responsibility yeah. of you and Eddie Murphy basically carrying this thing to, to build it back into you know what it became? Yeah, it was, with great respect to uh, Lord Michaels and the original cast, you know. So, so it, it, it's a good question because Eddie and I, and I think the reason for the success, by the grace of God, 
was we were very uh, cocky, young, and flippant. And Eddie, I was about almost nine years older than Eddie. And and when I met Eddie, we just we just hit. And he's just a grounded uh, individual. Eddie is, and he's a lot of fun. And, and and aside the fact that he's a comic genius, a true comic genius, Eddie Murphy is. So now, but when we got together, it was like so weird. We we were like brothers. We didn't care about anything, Chase. We didn't care about nothing. Joe, I'm telling you, when I tell you flippant, cocky, could care less. When we so so listen, this was the scene. So we we do the first ten shows. We replace the original Saturday Night Live. Epic. People don't understand. Younger folks listening to you now, on uh, the game, they don't. They're not going to understand. This was the television show, in the 1970s, rolling into 1980. We replaced it and we glitched. We just weren't doing great. So now they're going to reboot the whole show. They bring in Dick Ebersol, famous sports producer, you know, great producer. And they, and they, one, we go in this room and one by one, and they had some great time. Gilbert Gottfried was in that original cast, you wow. know, and, and I know, and I came up with Gilly through the clubs in New York and Gilly goes in, he walks out. I go, what's up? He goes, I got fired. Next got fired. They were whacking everybody, man. Whack it. Boom. Fire. <laughs> boom. Fire. Boom. And we're going, and me and Eddie are there going, what, what is going, me and Eddie, we had comedy slots at the comedy clubs, you know, like, in, like in about an hour from where we were. And I'm going like, you know, I said, what's going on? So they go, Murphy, Piscopo, come into my office. Like that. It was like that, like the military. <laughs> so Eddie and I go into Dick Ebersole's office. Yeah. And I, not that you wouldn't know that with your general managers there at the station. Not that you would understand. It, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you know, they call you in. It's me and Eddie behind the desk there in Lorne Michaels' office. But it was Dick Ebersole. And he goes like this. He goes, well, We've decided to keep uh, you two on in the show. And me and Eddie looked at each other and we went, hey, great, Dick. Look, we got a comedy shot uh, about an hour. Can we leave now? But thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) When I I think about it, and Eversol must have thought, like, what were these little brats? But you know what? That cockiness, by the grace of God, I tell you, really, it translated to TV, I guess, because we just plain didn't care. You know, it was like that, 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 and I, I fed off of Eddie. I got to give Eddie all the credit because he was, he, when the, one of the most exciting things for me is when we would be live because we had no safe, we had no delay. I know you guys may be on a delay. We're on a nine second delay in our radio show yeah. in the morning. And then, and then because of Richard Pryor and George Carlin, and all the guys that were on SNL and Belushi himself, the great Belushi, they had a, a delay on the original. I don't believe we had a delay. So when I was live with Eddie, and what you saw as kids, we we were – it was – I just fed off of his flippant, careless, kind of fun, reckless abandon. And it was – and it just added to the show. That's some of the fondest things and the immense respect I have for, for my young friend Eddie Murphy, man, at the time. It was great. And we just we – just, we did what we wanted to do. And you know what? Hey, you are black and I am white. You are blind as a bat, and I have sight. You can't do that stuff today. You just can't do it. I mean, really. Oh, oh gosh. Oh, you know, it was fun. It was fun, and, and we did what we want, and, and it was great. And you guys were like two years old when you were watching. No, that. no, 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 no. <laughs> wow. I, I vividly remember every second of that, Joe. <laughs> So what was it, it was like good. What was it like watching when, when Eddie made his return to SNL a few years ago? You know, it was great. It was it was great to watch, uh, uh, you know, but it's different. I, I was just there. Uh, I'm sworn to secrecy because they have some things coming up. But but I was just there and going back into the studio. And then I, I always honestly and frankly on the radio, I'm always organically honest on the radio. I knew I wouldn't get invited back to that show because of my politics, you know, I mean, you know, and, and that's, and it's, un, it's sad that we're there where we are. And I never asked, you know, I was surprised I went to the reunion like 10 years ago. I'd be surprised if I'm asked to go to the 50th reunion because the politics get in the way. Right. But I got to tell I got to tell you this, that aside, watching Eddie in the middle, and it was worse a couple of years ago. It's getting better now. Like watching Eddie go up there and do velvet Jones I mean, it's it's like a pimp, yeah. And, he, and he's doing it on Saturday Night Live in like twenty 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 three, whatever it was. And he goes, uh, and they go, hey, uh, Velvet, wasn't that the sketch where they go, aren't you afraid of the Me Too movement? And he goes, hey, you like women? And they go, well, yes, we do. And he goes, Me Too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I went, yes. I went, man. Are you kidding me? And I, 
I just had a left. I have such pride and respect for Eddie and, and such a great memories. I thought he was great. And you need more Chappelle. You need, I got to tell you guys too, when, when Eddie got the Kennedy, um, he got the Kennedy prize. It was like the Mark Twain prize. That's what it was yeah. at the Kennedy center. Well, yeah. Yeah. So we went down and this was, this had to be six, seven years ago, whatever it was. And I go down there and it was, it was uh, me. It was Georgie Lopez. It was Dave Chappelle. It was, um, it was Arsenio Hall, Dick Gregory. You guys are young, but Dick Gregory was like a monumental mm-hmm. uh, a, a black comic that really, really was uh, a true social justice warrior, you know, brilliant. And all these guys were down there, and it was like the Mount Rushmore of ethnic comedy, and then me, you know what I mean? I was, I, <laughs> I was like the white guy. I was like the token white guy down there, you know? And, and, but the, the, when, when, and Tracy Morgan was there, and it was right after the, the accident, you know? They were brutal off mic, off camera. We went out to dinner down there in Washington. We all went out together. And I want to tell you, brutal comedy has got to stay that way, man. I I mean, you got to be harsh. That's why Eddie is important. That's why Chappelle is so important. You know, it's like, you know, I always look to how Pryor broke ground. I'm real clean on stage. You know, I'm real, real straight. But you, you need those guys. They're like pioneers, really. So and so, it's great to hang with those guys. And and again, when I think back at those days, fellas, I don't think you could do half the stuff we did on the show. Oh. You couldn't do it today. <laughs> you Am are I right. Correct. Uh, we're talking to the great Joe Piscopo coming to town this weekend at Sinatra's Bar and Lounge. Uh, Joe Piscopo, Lloyd Morgan, T. Graham Brown, big event Saturday night at Sinatra Bar and Lounge. Joe, the event sold out. So there you go. You yeah, did your yeah, job. Yeah. You know, you know what? I got to tell you, the respect I have for the, the Sinatra family, Mr. Sinatra himself. So we do a show on, on I, I do a show at WABC in New York uh, called Sundays with Sinatra. And, and it's about it's a, it's it's all about paying tribute to Francis Albert Sinatra. It is more popular. It's more popular than ever before, because people get the old, get we call him the old man out of respect. Like he's the admiral, the captain, Frank Sinatra. Like he's the boss, you know. And when you we, we pay tribute to Mr. Sinatra, you should see all the young people listening. The numbers are through the roof on the show. So we're going down to Nashville. The club is doing great because it, that, the legacy. And then this, guys, Frank Sinatra just this week, it just broke yesterday. He's, he's number one and number two on the jazz charts on Billboard. Wow. He's been gone for 25 years. He's got, he hit number one with the albums, The Ultimate Sinatra and Nothing But the Best. Is that wild, though? Uh, How wild is that? I mean, only the chairman of the board could do that. It's cuckoo, baby. It's swinging, baby. It's cuckoo. Come on. (laughs) You know what? You could say, you know, and you can't can't even – remember the old man, he would go, hey, let's get some broads. You can't even say that now, you know? You're not allowed to say – you got to be careful. On the radio, you got to be careful. But but you know what? He could do it, and that tenor and that tone and that class and that distinction of Frank Sinatra, the, 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 the always dressed up. Always with always impeccable, and and by the way, treating women he always did with such immense respect, and that's that's what it's all about, and that's what the Sinatra Club and, and that bar and lounge down there in Nashville is. It epitomizes. If you guys want to get in, look, I know a guy. I know a guy. What am I going to tell you? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're there. All right, so Joe, my Joe, my phone is blown up because one of my all-time favorite movies, and you know where I'm going with this. Is Johnny yeah. Dangerously, and people are asking, <laughs> did you have any idea, because that's become like a cultural hit, did you have any yeah. idea at the time how just great this movie would, and it's long-lasting how this movie, how Johnny Dangerously is? Any idea? No, it's a great, that's a great question, because when you do it, it was, it was my, really my first really film, and we had such fun doing it. And you never know if it's going to translate to the airways. And Michael Keaton is the best. He is funny. He, I'm telling you what, he is a funny cat. I got to tell you, Michael Keaton is. And don't forget Danny DeVito in the film and, and Richard Dimitri, who did, uh, um, you know, he did the Maroney. He did yes. The, I, can I say, can I say Fargan? I saw you can, can say, say Fargan. I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he goes too far. Fargan bastards. It was, that was, <laughs> oh my. And, and with a shout out to Amy Heckerling was the director. And, and Norman Steinberg wrote most of that. And I got to tell you, we just had such fun. We laughed our way through the whole film. Then it opened. And I remember, guys, they had, they had a big billboard on Hollywood Boulevard with me, Michael Keaton, and Mary Lou Henner, who was spectacular. And I said, wow, this is cool. And it, margin, it opened marginally. And it was okay, 
but open marginally. But the legs afterwards, what they call the legs of it afterwards, no, I had no idea. I had no idea. Uh, people, it's like all over the world. It's so weird. You know, my, my mother hung me on a hook once. <laughs> once you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. I, can I tell you a story? Now? You got time? Can I tell you? Heck yeah, go. Story? You know, so, so I'm with Keaton, who, I, again, great actor, and I knew him from the clubs, and he's just a great guy. And so I was the bad guy, Danny Vermin. And then the, the action was, uh, I, I told him off, and then he was going to grab me and hang me on that hook. So I had a harness on. I had a harness on around my chest with a, with a cut in the back of my suit with a hook. So Michael had a little, and then a, an apple box right behind me. And I'm facing Michael. Michael's facing the door. I had to back up. So all you saw was, so when Michael grabbed my chest, he had to lift me up. Now, I helped him because I stepped onto that apple box. And then he, Michael had to hit the hook perfectly with the little latch that I had behind. Him. And so it was, how we did it, I have no idea. I'm talking to I said, you know, something about what I was saying, you know, uh, Johnny, this, that, the other thing. And he grabs me and he tries it. We miss. He tries it again. We're missing. I got, I'm, I'm getting <laughs> and, then, and then Amy Heckley came over and said, it's not reading on camera. You know, 35 milliliter back then, guys. So it was like, it, it, it's not reading. You've got to really go for this one. Michael goes like this. He goes, after I told him, oh, Johnny, this, that, the other thing, Keaton hits me on the chest, blew the air out of me. He went, yo, like that, <laughs> grabbed me. I step up. He jams me on that hook, man. <laughs> what you saw was real. And then I had to stay straight and take a beat and go, you shouldn't hang me on a hook, Johnny. My mother hung me on a hook once, once, and I had my finger up, and then Keaton opens the door, and I kept my face, I put the <laughs> finger up, <laughs> and then we just kind of ad-libbed that, you know, and never, and then we saw it, he said, you know, we should do it in threes, because comedy is always in threes, so that's why you hear it later on, the once, you know, you shouldn't, yes. see, you know, blah, blah, bang, and that sort of thing, you know, oh, oh man, but I'm, it's nice to see you, I thank you for bringing that up, because great you know, great memories, and the film, it, it's crazy, but it really holds up to this day in many ways. Oh, my goodness. Joe Piss. Joe, thank you. I know you're a busy man. Safe travels. Yeah, man. When you get tomorrow night, when you're at Sinatra's and somebody comes up and whispers in your ear that Chase <laughs> and Big Joe are there, just let us in. That's all we ask. You know what? I know, I listen, we'll take care of you. I swear, I promise, guys. Chase and Big Joe, I'll talk to Mr. Miller. We'll get you in there. Tina Sinatra. It's the Sinatra family. I'm broadcasting live there on Sunday night. Come on by as well. I, uh, it'll be 5 o'clock Nashville time, broadcasting all around the country, Sundays with Sinatra. And, uh, guys, with uh, great respect, we appreciate you uh, allowing us to get the word out. We're very excited about the Nashville uh, Bar and Lounge and our celebration with the one-year anniversary. In the name of Francis Albert Sinatra, baby. There you go. Joe, thank you, man. Thank God you, bless Joe. you. Love you, man. God, God bless you, too. Love you back, fellas. Maybe I'll see you tomorrow night. Take yeah, care. Absolutely. Bye -bye. Joe Bye -bye. Piscopo joining Bye -bye. us here on the program. Woo! Oh, that was fun. Yeah. That was great stuff for sure. Uh, we'll uh, put a bow on things. I'll give you quick WrestleMania predictions and maybe birthdays. We'll do that next. Chase and Big Joe, 1025, 1063 The Game. All right, as I recover from that great interview with our good friend Joe Piscopo, listen, friends, I love hearing from all of you who have used medical house cars, house calls and love the experience and the care. Here's how it works. One, you're going to give them a call. All visits with medical house calls start with a phone call with one of the providers to determine the extent of your need. Secondly, pick your treatment. Answer a few questions. They'll provide you with the best treatment options, home visit, telehealth, or virtual prescription. Third, you're going to feel better in no time. That's right. Their great medical staff will get you up and going and, yeah, feeling better. Board-certified nurse practitioners and physician's assistants will guide you the entire way. In fact, our good friend Chuck McDowell used medical house calls. So impressed with their service, their commitment, and their care, he bought the company. That's right. This was the website, medicalhousecalls.com. That is medicalhousecalls.com, where the nearest clinic is your home.
Are you ready? Chasing Big Joe, 1025, 1063, the game. I know we're uh, pretty much out of time. Caroline Willie and D Mace coming up next. So I will give uh, I'll give some quick predictions on WrestleMania weekend with just some of the big matches. Two nights in Philadelphia. The uh, the set looks awesome at Lincoln Financial Field. I do hope Jason Kelsey shows up. That would be that would be awesome. Uh, Big Joe versus Chase for <laughs> we, we, you and I in a match. Yeah, we can yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah, we do that. All right, uh, real quick. Women's World Championship match: Becky Lynch, Rhea Ripley, uh, Ripley the champion. Um, I actually think Rhea retains and beats Becky Lynch. Uh, I think a lot of people think Becky's going to win, but I know her contract, I believe, is up. I don't know what's going to happen there. I actually think Ripley um, does win that match. The Intercontinental Championship, Sami Zayn uh, challenges Gunther, who has been the champion for almost two years. I think Sami pulls another upset, and he defeats Gunther for the IC title. Jey Uso versus Jimmy Uso, brother versus brother. I've, I want to say Jay wins that match, but I feel like there's going to be some sort no, of no, no. These are your predictions. I, no, don't I, I, just I, say it. Hang on. I want to say Jay is going to win that match, okay. but I think Jimmy cheats and ends up winning the match. <laughs> he always cheats. I think Solo um, six pack ladder match for the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championship. They did say that both belts have to be grabbed for the match to be over. I think they end up splitting the championship, and so I think. Uh, Awesome Truth with our truth and the Miz, they win, and then I think Austin Theory and Grayson Waller also win. So I think uh, the titles get split up. Uh, night number two, oh, and obviously the uh, the big tag match: Cody Rhodes and Seth freaking Rollins against the Rock and Roman Reigns. Rock and Roman win that match. Bloodline rules for uh, Sunday night. Uh, I think that Drew McIntyre defeats Seth Rollins for the World Heavyweight Championship, and then Damian Priest cashes in his money in the bank, and he wins the title. Uh, I believe that Bailey will defeat EO Sky for the WWE Women's Championship match. In that match, Logan Paul defends the U.S. title against Randy Orton and Kevin Owens. I think Kevin Owens wins that. And then the big one, Cody Rhodes, Roman Reigns for the championship, the undisputed championship cody finally finishes the story and defeats roman reigns the rock then kicks roman reigns out of the bloodline as the final boss setting up roman reigns versus the rock next year you got these written down we're gonna go over monday yep i got them written down okay he should be a part of the storyline chase should be just writing all the story he's I phenomenal well, we're, gonna, we're gonna see how well he does okay i love it so we'll see i'll be watching i know a lot of people will be watching. can i ask a stupid question real quick yes uh can you bet on this stuff offshore Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't a stupid question. No? Okay. No. Like, you can't do it, like, on FanDuel and things okay. like that. But the offshore. Offshore. Can. Percy Priest Lake. Yep. That yeah, is going to do it for us here on this Friday edition. We've had a lot of fun. Joe Piscopo was fantastic. We got more stuff lined up for next week. Oh. I can't wait. Oh, yeah. Uh, real quick, to our guys out there, we see it every day, 988 on your cell phone. If you need to talk to somebody, before, before you do anything, please talk to someone. You can talk to us. Call the line. Remember, we love you. Our world's a better place because you are here. Please know that. Bumping out with some ECW in honor of Philadelphia, the birthplace of ECW. Paul Heyman going to the Hall of Fame tonight. Well-deserved. He's been on the show as well. Peace, love, rock and roll. Caroline, Willie, and D. Mace coming up next. 1025, 1063, The Game.
Falk to his right. So Forsberg got the empty netter from Nyquist and McDonough. As the puck is stolen away at center and thrown into the empty net. Mark Jankowski with the honors there. 6-3 the score now with 36 and a half to go. How about those freaking predators? It will never get old. Starting the show with those few words. How about those freaking predators? Predators take down the same mind that I'll use his <laughs> phrase. It wasn't pretty, but it was beautiful. It was not pretty for all three periods last night for the Nashville Predators, but they found a way to win in a game that they had to have it. Caroline, Willie, D. Mace, we are live from the Busy Bee Heating, Plumbing, Cooling, and Air Conditioning Studios. Willie D. is here before he heads out to New York. Predators on a little New York road trip coming up this weekend. D. Mace is here as well. How about those Predators? How about those Predators? Sound like how about those Cowboys, huh? But um, never mind about the Cowboys. But those Predators, I mean, listen, they played. Now, Five on five was a little bit testy, um, but when they got into their special teams, their power play, uh, yeah. they executed um, flawlessly and they stopped St. Louis from executing on their power play. So um, they did what they needed to do um, to win. It got a little hairy, I thought, uh, for a quick minute there. But then, you know, the Predators put in another goal and kind of iced the game. Um, but this was a this was another game where. You know, they found a way to win. UC Soros has done exactly what he has been doing throughout this last, you know, last half of the season or last two months of the season. He's been, you know, just like a, a, a bolt in that net. Um, he's been playing at a level that that we are accustomed to seeing him play. And you you need to credit that win to him because he did an excellent job because he was getting pelted, but he did an excellent job at standing strong and 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 allowed the Nashville Predators to to pick up a win last night against the St. Louis Blues, which they desperately needed. Um, and you see how bad St. Louis needed it too. They poured their goalie, you know, um, <laughs> just to get to, just to try to get some points um, yeah. because they knew one point to them. It, it wasn't going to work. They needed two points. Um, but fortunately for the Nashville Predators, they were able to handle that. They ended up getting a penalty, so they had to put Bennington back in the net. Um, but they 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 did what they needed to do here at home. Um, that atmosphere was like a playoff atmosphere, um, and they rose up to the occasion. So kudos to them for, you know, playing a hell of a game, even though they do have things they need to straighten out. But their power play was awesome. It was uh, it was a very interesting game, uh, and I agree with everything you guys have said. It just seemed like the hockey gods were were saying, "Okay, you guys are going to have to go the hard way if you're going to win this game." Because every time it looked like they were going to push ahead and bury them, all of a sudden the Blues would come back and uh, really take control of the game. I thought for the yeah. first forty minutes or so, the Blues were the quicker faster mm-hmm. team they were making more plays they were moving up the ice better the Predators were having trouble a lot so they come out the Predators score the first goal of the game they started the top guys they finally switched the uh the starting lineup and it pays off with an early goal and you're thinking in fact I I can document this I got a text from Jared Stillman because he mm-hmm. said they're gonna blow him out tonight you watch they're gonna blow him out and of course Yossi scores and seconds later here comes the text oh. see here comes the blowout. <laughs> Told you. And then you fast seconds into the game. Yeah, and then at the end of the first period, they're being outshot twenty to ten, and it's one one. And you're sitting there saying, "Man, thank goodness for the post. Thank goodness for UC Soros because they could be down a couple goals here, right?" Mm-hmm. And then even midway through the game, they're up two to one, and they're being outshot. I think twenty eight to fourteen at one point, and it, it wasn't just soft shots, right? These were quality chances that the Blues were getting. Then the Luke Shen play happens where for a moment you're panicking. You're seeing deja vu all mm-hmm. over. And uh, you're thinking, is Shen going to be out for the game and they're going to get a five-minute power play here? I thought they made the right call. They get the kill. 
they get the power play, and boom, they get the huge goal at the end of the second period to go up 3-1. But it still wasn't easy in the third. You know, it's just like every time you thought, okay, whew, XL, they've got it, the Blues would push back. So it was, it was a fun game, but I, I like how they really had to work for it. And uh, you bring up the Shen call. I would have lost my freaking marbles had they <laughs> not reversed that call from a five-minute major to a two-minute minor. Because I, I will, in fairness, in real time, it looked bad. Like, it uh-huh. looked like Luke Shen just hit him against the boards, and it looked like from one angle that they showed on the broadcast that Luke Shen's stick just went right into Jordan Cairo, like, like right into his chest. So in real time, I, I understood. Like, I, I saw it. It looked bad. And then you slow it down. You realize, well, Jordan Cairo just fell down, and there was really nothing that Luke Shen could have done. It wasn't malicious. It wasn't a hit to the head. It wasn't anything like that. It was just... Kairu fell down. It's the laws of physics. Luke Shen can't slow down. The only thing that's going to slow him down is basically ramming Jordan Kairu into the board. So a, a two-minute minor, fine. That would have been fine. They would have taken the penalty away altogether. Honestly, I obviously you could say, of course you would have agreed with that call, but I, I think that they could have taken it away entirely, but I had zero problem with a two-minute minor. A five-minute major, I think, was completely uh, overkill especially combined with the Ryan McDonough situation that we saw against the Colorado Avalanche on Saturday. Um, so I thought that that was the right call. But normally we catch up with uh, C-Mace, Chris Mason, at 1130 on Fridays. Like I mentioned, Willie and C-Mace and the rest of the Predators broadcast crew, they're headed out to New York. Uh, Predators taking on the Islanders and then the Devils this weekend. So C-Mace joins us now See, Mace, it, it wasn't the prettiest game that the Predators have played. It wasn't the best game that the Predators have played. But between UC Soros and a power play that looked night and day different, the Predators found a way to win, even in a game that wasn't their best. What made you encouraged about that game last night about the, against the St. Louis Blues? Well, I, I think kind of the things that you just mentioned, I, um, after the Boston game, uh, Bruno called out the power play and said, you know, we played a pretty good game. Our power play had opportunities, uh, you know, to, to get us a lead or to win that hockey game. And um, they didn't do it. They're kind of disconnected. They're not playing fast right now. And they came out and they responded. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's the sign of a good team. Uh, you know, accountable players instead of going, uh, you know, sulking and saying, oh, the coach is mad at us. And he said, we're not getting it done. And these are guys that understand how they have to play and what they have to do. And at the end of the day, it's results and it's outworking a penalty kill. And most penalty kills are the opposition's uh, hardest working guys. So you got to bring it. And uh, I thought they did against St. Louis. Um, I also agree with you. I don't think that the guys played very well. I I don't think it was a good game um, hardly at all, uh, to be honest. LinkedIn gave up a couple soft goals, in my opinion. But like you said, good teams find a way to win. The power play stepped up. I thought the penalty kill was really good. Uh, I believe they gave up a power play goal, but um, a penalty kill goal, but um, they were awesome. Uh, and, and Soros, that's the other thing that's really encouraging to me is that's two back-to-back big games for him. I thought he looked uh, – that might have been, in my opinion, his best game of the year just because St. Louis is all over uh, the Preds, especially that first period, and they got a lot of really good looks. There's a lot of deflections, a lot of net front, a lot of playoff-style situations, in my opinion. And uh, Juice Juice was phenomenal. UC Soros was phenomenal. And that's two back-to-back games that we've seen a great outing from UC Soros. Chris Mason is with us. And from your perspective, and from the goalie side of things, because I've seen a lot of Predators fans that I've noticed Predators fans, they can never just take a good thing. There's always got to be a, an underlying sense of anxiety uh, going into the playoffs. And I think some Predators fans have been anxious about UC Soros' history in the playoffs. From your perspective, how different is the game from a goalie perspective once you find yourself in the playoffs? Uh, it's it's really different, but I mean, like at, at the end of the day, as as UC Soros really played on a team that is expected to be competitive in the playoffs, I don't think so. I mean, the uh, you know the one year in the bubble, that's it, right? Who knows how that's going to go? I don't think there's been a real situation where you could say, all right, this this is a team, and you know that's going to make a run at it. Obviously, he got hurt in that Colorado series; we didn't even see him there. So I, I just don't think he's had that much experience and that much of a 
you know, track record to really be able to make an opinion one way or another. So to me, this one, uh, this is the one. This is one where I think, you know, this team, um, they're constructed the right way. They've got the, the right mentality. They're obviously going to play uh, a top team in the first round. They won't be expected to win, but people are talking about the Predators now. That, hey, they're going to be a they're going to be a tough out. This is a team that could upset somebody, and I agree with that. Um, but they're going to play. They're going to be playing a tough opponent. And to me, the difference in the series, I think, is a guy like UC Saros. You know, he he can be the difference maker in a series. He can make or break just like any other goaltender. Uh, but I think this, this season in particular, this year, uh, for me, is the one where I, I really want to see uh, how he performs in the postseason. We'll talk with C. Mace, Chris Mason, one half of the broadcasting team for the Nashville Predators, discussing their 63 victory over St. Louis Blues last night. A much needed win. I'm not going to say it was a, you know, a dire win, but I think they needed to win. Um, to sort of stop the bleeding of the past three games. Now, in, in regards to that, C. Mace, what what does this do for that locker room? Because they were on a three-game losing streak, and albeit they wasn't playing bad, um, but they were not finishing out games. But what does a game like this, beating St. Louis for the third time, what does this do for a team that it seems like the walls were closing in for a quick minute now, but now to me it seems like, okay, now we're back to our winning ways. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's uh, what it did is, you know, you're, you go on that streak, you, you know, you're, you're invincible and, and all of a sudden you're, you're not. And, you know, you kind of think, are we that good? Or was that just a flu? You know, when you lose one, oh, no big deal. Well, you lose two, you lose three, you know, they don't win that game. Uh, you know, all of a sudden St. Louis, they've got life and they're closer. They don't have that hard of a schedule left. Uh, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're kind of second guessing yourself, I think. But now that the fact that they are able to win that game, uh, you know, get that separation from St. Louis, um, it's going to be tough for the Blues. You know, they, they they have to win out. The Preds have to lose out, basically, which is not likely going to happen. So, you're you're good again. You know, you have that confidence in your group. You did the right things. You got a lot of good performances. Your big guys stepped up and made plays. Um, you know, your special teams. I think it's just uh, another. A confidence booster for this group to say, all right, now we can kind of, you know, go and, and keep taking care of business the way that we were before and get, you know, get that good feeling uh, in before the playoffs start because you, you don't want to go, you know, it doesn't always necessarily matter, but you don't want to limp into playoffs. You don't want to just barely make it. You don't want to have it come down to the last two games or the last game of the season and end up needing help, um, you know, even though the Blues would have had a tough time anyway, but you never know. You know, we've, we've all seen crazy things in sports. So you just want that separation. And most of all, for this group, you just want that, that confidence and that swagger back. And uh, I think that win is, is one that could do it. Now, looking at their their lines, it's just, just about everybody, on, at least one person, it seems, on on either line got a score. Um, what does that mean? Um, for for the Predators moving forward because it's not, and we've talked about this for the longest, um, that through this streak, um, they've been getting tremendous play outside of that first line. And they also got tremendous play outside of the first line last night. So what does that do for the confidence of the other line? Because you know what you're going to get with the first line. But as you enter the playoffs, you got to get more than just, you know, scoring and, 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 and things like that for the first line. You need it from the other lines as well. Yeah, I think, you know, for for the team, I think that's we've, – we've seen all season when they have all four lines going, um, that's when they're at their best. That's when other teams really have a tough time matching up against them. And I think as a coaching staff, too, you're just like, all right, we got – it doesn't really matter the situation. I know sometimes they like to put the no-back line out in offensive zone situations so or put systems out in defensive zone. But you don't really worry as much about that. And at any given point, you know, you, you can have production – in any game because in playoffs, obviously their folk, the other team's focal point is going to be, hey, you shut down that top line, we're going to win, you know, the series. Shut down Forsberg, shut down Nyquist and O'Reilly, and we like our chances. But I think the Predators have proven over the streak and over the course of the year when they're successful, they're getting production from every line. The fourth line was a big part of that. They were really good early in that streak, um, you know, contributing offensively. We've seen, I think, Evangelista, and uh, Mark Jankowski, uh, he, he's been unreal. 
you know, lately. You get production from, from that line. And then, you know, Zucker started to score. And Sisson's, you know, he's, he's had a career year. And then Bovillier gets his first. Um, so I just, that's how they're built. And I think you knew at the start of the year that the only way the Predators are going to have a chance is if they get those kind of contributions because they've got a deep lineup and you're hoping some of those young guys could pay off Novak. He's one I, I think could maybe get going a little bit here, but their line's playing well. Um, so I, I think for the group, you look around the room and you're like, hey, every, every guy, every line we put out has got a chance to win the game that night. That's a, that's a really good feeling and it you know, makes everybody feel uh, you know, about three inches taller when everyone's going together. We're talking to Chris Mason as uh, the team gets ready to head to the New York area. Islanders Saturday, Devils on Sunday. Islanders have crept back into a playoff spot, so that is going to be an enormous game for them. And Nashville now magic number four to clinch the playoff spot. Mace, last night, you know, it wasn't our broadcast, and it, it was so chaotic. There were so many goals scored late. They didn't really get a chance to uh, really tell the crowd, but Philip Forsberg has now hit a couple of more benchmarks. He just keeps doing it. So I, I don't think there's any discussion anymore at all. This is his best all-around season, and it's not even close. I agree. I mean, you know, the year in him and Duchesne were going back. That was a, a great season. He put up, uh, you know, points per game, had a great season. But I, I think all around, I mean, I really think, I think we've all felt this all along that he's a star player, but he hadn't quite maybe reached his full potential because you've seen, I think, spurts of his, you know, tenacity and, and physicality and, you know, but it wasn't as consistent this year. I, I feel like he has just been on a mission. I think he's finally, you know, found himself and, and knows exactly what kind of player he wants to be. He's turned himself into a, a power forward that's responsible defensively, that plays just as hard without the puck uh, as he does with the puck. The type of goals he's scored, you know, 70% of his goals are in the in zone one net front area where you have to pay a price to. He's jamming pucks in. He's He's tipping pucks. Um, you know, he, he could score 50 this year. You know, it, it's crazy. If he goes on a little bit of a tear here, he's been uh, he's been just awesome. And I think, you know, now he's entered, in my opinion, uh, I, you know, you call, I would call him a superstar in this league now. I think he's taken that, uh, that step into, you know, the elite players uh, that we always talk about. And I think he's in that group now. Mace, are you uh, racing the Harley-Davidson motorcycle gang or something? You got some serious engine flow going around you so oh, that's uh that's that's my truck i think but i, I just got off the highway so i'm uh, i'm just pulling into the I'm on donaldson now he's it, going d-may so, speed it sounded like somebody was was putting it in some serious yeah, gear some motorcycles or something yeah it's it's a v8 five liter truck so yeah it's loud sometimes had to hit the gas Sorry, a little bit uh Mace, I want to ask you about one other guy, and he, does, he doesn't he does get the headlines, but I, I think it's worth continuing to bring up. I noticed so many plays last night because there were a lot of scrambles, and the Predators didn't have the puck. And, and you know, from day one, Andrew Burnett, we want to have the puck. And they've defended so well that they've had the puck a lot this entire year. But last night was one of those weird nights where they didn't have the puck a lot. The Blues were taking the game to them. And that's where I really noticed Ryan McDonough so subtle but how many how many scoring plays did he you know jam up or cross up just by his savvy he is he really is he's you know we talk about a lot on the broadcast because he does so many things that you know when you first see a play you might not realize he, he never panics he always seems to be in the right position his anticipation and just awareness of you know kind of been there done that before um, and having that composure in those hectic moments when, you know, a team's all over you, they've been in the zone for 45 minutes, and his ability to, you know, to break up a good scoring chance or get the puck back or block a shot and pay the price. And he's just been unreal, you know. And I think last year, you know, we saw that as well, but more so this year. And just, um, you know, the value of what he does. And, and you could see other guys doing the same thing. I think you can see Carrier's learned you know, from Ryan McDonough and all the guys, I'd say everybody on the team, even Yossi, some of the things that, that he does uh, back there, I, I think it really rubbed off on this team and made them a lot better defensively. But he is just, uh, he's had an incredible year. And we've seen his, you know, offensive uh, savvy a little bit as well. He gets second uh, power play time. And, you know, we didn't really get to see much of those uh, types of skills last season. And, 
he, he's had an unreal year and, and, and such a, I'd say he's the unsung MVP this year, the guy that doesn't get the, you know, the credit that maybe he deserves. Last one for you, Mace, because I know you and Willie have to run to catch the plane, but looking ahead, because it did kind of feel like we can now breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief. You take care of St. Louis. That's a four point swing, two points you get, two points that St. Louis doesn't get. But the Predators don't still don't have that X by their name. They're going to make the playoffs, but there's still work that they have to do. So what comes next? How do you kind of stay focused and look ahead to the Islanders and the Devils this weekend rather than feeling like, okay, we can kick our feet up because taking care of St. Louis was something that we had to do when we took care of it? Yeah, that's a, it's a good point. I, I think right now, I, I think they understand. They've got guys that have won. You always thought we've talked about that a lot this year. And I think when you have guys like that in your locker room, you know, they know that this, you just can't go in, you know, playing – you know, half halfway going into playoffs and expect to get off to a good start against the powerhouse. You got to go in with your game in order. You know, things have to be uh, things have to be all and well. Uh, you know, in that locker room and on the ice. So I, I think that'll be the focus. It helps that you have the Islanders that are. It's going to be they're going to be a, probably the most desperate team we've seen. Um, you know, in the last little while, and St. Louis I would say is up there. So I think that helps. But when you get into the Columbus, Chicago, Pittsburgh type of games those will be tough and whether they, they decide if they once they clinch once they get that x will they rest guys or what are they going to do but you still have to have that uh, that level of play and and, and standard uh, the relentlessness that they've played with uh you know throughout this last half of the season so it'll be very interesting it, it, it's it's tough you know it's, it's a different mindset because you don't quite have that urgency um but you full well know that you got to be playing hard because that's that's what guys get hurt too you know, if you're not playing, you, you kind of 85 percent or 90 percent out with us, you know, rest up a little bit, you know, quotation marks, you still got to play the game. But um, that's when guys get hurt and that's when you get off to uh, you're not ready to go in the playoffs. So I, I think they'll be fine, but it is a challenge. See, Mace, appreciate you for fitting us in this morning. Thanks for adjusting your schedule to hop on with us. Willie D, uh-huh. see, Mace, safe travels to New York and we'll catch up with you next week. Thank you, guys. Anything for you guys. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. And you guys be safe. I heard earthquakes in New York this morning. I'm assuming that's not disrupting travel for you or the Predators. As far as we know, that is uh, that is the case. So, wow. yeah, that was a little. I mean, you hear earthquake, you're thinking, oh, California or something. Uh, northeast? Uh, quite odd. N- not yeah. normally what you think of. Not normally what you think of. But safe travels, Willie. Have a good call tomorrow and Sunday. And we'll see you on Monday. You got it. All right. Willie, you are the best. Coming up next, D-Mace, I want to get into the people's thoughts because I know that the people have a ton of reaction and they are fired up about the win last night. So we'll get into your thoughts. 615-737-1025 is the phone number. And I think there's a glass half full and glass half empty mentality that you could take to the play on the ice, not the outcome, but what you saw from the Predators. And why I'm taking... A glass half full mentality, we'll discuss. We'll get into that coming up next and do our phones as well. Caroline, Willie, D. Mace, we are brought to you by Zen Sports. Start earning cash rewards on your bets today. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-889-9789. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older and in Tennessee to bet. All right. Uh, speaking of the Predators, let's talk about Lee Company, a big sponsor of our Predators coverage here on 1025 The Game. So let's make sure we have the message out that they like to throw out there. I know right now we're kind of bobbing back and forth between using your air conditioning and your heating. And some days you don't know which one's which. Some days you're using both. But that's where Lee, Lee Company and the relationship with their home maintenance plan can be so effective for you because. You know you're covered. You know those services are going to be there all year round. And so your air conditioning and your heating unit will not fail you. And they'll be on top of it, especially during those crisis moments where it gets super cold like it did a couple months ago and then super hot like it's going to be in the next couple of months. The home maintenance plan, you pay a small monthly fee, eight, nine bucks a month. And in, in exchange for that, you get not only the yearly updates, and checks on your heating, cooling, plumbing, and electric systems, but also you get discounts on those repairs when needed. 
615-567-1000 is the phone number to call. 615-567-1000 or go to LeeCompany.com. It's Lee Company, proud sponsor, Nashville Predators. that he hasn't practiced uh, in a while too. Oh, yeah, give him a hard time. time. Yeah, <laughs> but he's okay. He's fine. He's, he's, I think we're just going to keep him off the ice. He's, he's playing just fine. So <laughs> I was, was going to say, you may as well keep going like that. I know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. We told him too, like, he don't maybe just take the summer off and uh, don't <laughs> practice. But uh, no, he 
obviously he's he's battling through some stuff so um it's it's pretty cool to see how how he's battling through it and, and playing on that level and like i said before he can stay off as much as he wants if he keeps scoring like that you haven't practiced since February. Are you ever going to practice again? You're on a pretty big heater here. You're pretty fresh out here for these games. You're talking about practice? I'm talking about practice! I don't know. I, I want to get out there for sure, but uh, games are more important, thankfully, and uh, we just got to keep this going. Practice! Talking about practice? Phil Forsberg doesn't need to practice, and it is so funny because yesterday we were talking about this. Andrew Burnett was on Robbie and Rex Road, and they talked about, you know, what's been keeping Philip Forsberg out of practice. And a few weeks ago, Barry Trotz mentioned a cut that's been nagging Philip Forsberg. So he hasn't been he hasn't practiced in, in weeks. Two goals and an assist last night, first star of the game. Practice. We're talking about practice. Phil Forsberg doesn't need to practice. And last night, he tied the franchise record for single-season goals, tying Matt Duchesne's record. I think, the, and they're not going to say it, but I think the Predators would love it. And they are cheering like hell for Philip Forsberg to have that record and not Matt Duchesne, do you guys? I think we got D Mace on the mute. I think he just pulled the Joe Rex road. Okay, I was about to say I don't know if it's me that I can't hear anything or if that's on D Mace's side. I think it's uh yeah, we're just gonna call it a Joe Rex road for right that's now. That's a yeah, just Joe Rex roaded. Yeah. But anyway, I mean Philip Forsberg has been we've known that Philip Forsberg has been playing the best hockey of his career so far this season. And it was just apropos that we were talking about it yesterday. Like, is this any reason to be concerned? The Predators aren't going to be able to be competitive in the playoffs without the contributions of, of Philip Forsberg. And it's not just him. It's absolutely up and down the lineup. But the reason why the Predators are now in the position that they are in is because Philip Forsberg has been playing out of his mind this season. Is it because of the pieces around him? Is it because of Gus Nyquist and Ryan O'Reilly around him? Is it because of the Andrew Burnett system? Is it because of, is it a little bit of everything? I don't know. But whatever it is, it's working. T Mace. Do you got me? You there got you me go. back? You're, you're unrest. There we go. You just got unrest. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't on mute. I just had to pull it out of my computer. And then put it back in, and it started working again. So, but no, I mean, Philip Forsberg is 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 playing excellent hockey right now. I think what you said is a little bit of everything. Um, it's a little bit of coaching. It's a little bit of you know his line mates. It's a little bit of him figuring out now where his place is um, as the leader on his team, as in regards to on the ice. Um, the things that he can do now. I think he feels more comfortable in a system. Um, when you see a great player um, like him struggle a little bit, it's not because he's losing it or anything. It's just that he's figuring he's figuring out the new system. He has to possibly change the way that he plays a little bit. And once he gets used to that, then you start the great players. They figure it out. And once they figure it out, then you start to see the greatness in them. And that's what you're seeing now. And D-Base, looking at the game last night, I think there's probably two different perspectives that you could look at it mm -hmm. from. I know that myself and you and Willie and every Predators fan out there is glad that the Predators just found a way to win. But it didn't look very pretty in the process. So I think that one way that Predators fans could be looking at it, and frankly, I think some are looking at it, of, yeah, you won, but that's discouraging because you came out slow and St. Louis was just, it was right there with you until the very end, and that's concerning because you're going to be playing teams that are better than the St. Louis Blues in the playoffs, whether it's the Colorado Avalanche or the Dallas Stars or the Vancouver Canucks, so on and so forth. I think the way that I view it, though, D. Mace, is mm -hmm. when you're in the playoffs, you just have to find a way to win. All the Predators had to do last night was just find a way to win. Was that their best game? No. No, it wasn't. But they still found a way to win. They were able to find the net in two out of their three power play opportunities. That UC Soros was playing his freaking butt off. And once you get into the playoffs, because that's how I'm looking at the Preds right now, is, yeah, how would you play? Did you win? Did you lose? But also, if you did that in the playoffs, how would we feel? Can you play that way against a team like Dallas or Colorado? But in the playoffs, you just have to win. 
you have to find a mm-hmm. way to win. That's what the Predators did last night. Not even in their best game. Not even when they came out firing and fast and hungry. It looked like St. Louis wanted it more than they did, at least in the first period. You still found a way to win. Yeah, you, you did. And that's, all, that's what it's about. As you- How do we win? Uh, it may look ugly one day. It may look pretty. It may look pretty the other. But how do we win hockey games? We saw against the Boston Bruins. That was a hell of a game the Nashville Predators played. But they end up losing. Yeah. Then you watch them against the St. Louis Blues. There was some up and down in their play. It wasn't all, pe- you know, peachy creamy. It wasn't all, you know, everything wasn't executed the way it needed to be. But they found a way to win. They won because of their power play. They won because UC Sorrow stood on his head inside of net. That's what they're going to need once they get in the playoffs. They're going to need to play the way they did against Boston, but win how they won last night against the St. Louis Blues. So, right. you know, one game you play great and lose. Um, another game you don't play so well, but you end up winning. It's all about just winning, moving on to the next game. So, I'm not too worried um, about the last four games. I know they're one and three in that in that, in that span, but they played some. You can pick out good things in each game as well as you can pick out some bad things. But I think the way they played last night and the play they played against Boston, if you just put those two games together, if they can play like that, then they're going to win more games than not in the playoffs. The other thing that's really <clears throat> encouraging to me is we've now seen a trend where this team responds really well, where the power play was awful against Boston. You turn around a couple of days later, your power play is what wins you. And I had to have it kind of game. Let's mm-hmm. go back to the nine to two Dallas stars loss. Andrew Burnett publicly calls out the team for being on vacation. They turn around and go on a historic 18-game point run. So that is what's encouraging to me as well. It's not just all of these things that over time just continue to fester and fester and fester. And look, the power play hasn't been great all season long, but to see it be such an issue and to see it be really, I think, at a season low against Boston to turn around and see the power play Firing as it did last night, much quicker than they looked on Tuesday, the response has been encouraging. And that's a testament to the leaders on this team. And that's also a testament to Andrew Brunette. Well, then look at on the flip side, look at their defense versus St. Louis power play. St. Louis has six opportunities, six opportunities. And the Nashville Predators did an excellent job at penalty killing. They gave up one goal. But beside that, you and you're talking about a team that is able to score. Um, you hold them to just one goal on six tries. That's unbelievable. I mean, it, so you can take, you can look at some of the bad things that they did in the course of that game yesterday, but then you can look at some good things that they did that will help them moving forward. And one of them is the power kill, power play yeah. kill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get into some of your thoughts Penalty on that. Kill, excuse me. <laughs> Let's get into your so- thoughts on that. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. Phone lines driven by Wilson County, Hyundai.com. Dmates, we've got a lot of text in the text line about the commentary on the ESPN Plus broadcast last night. Yes. I will say, I was watching this game last night with, with Dylan, and Dylan said, where's Willie? Like, all upset, like, because <laughs> after the first period, he was like, get, like, get <laughs> Willie and C-Maze back on the broadcast because who are these guys? I have to agree. I didn't love the commentary last night. I could have done without some of the uh, the Bucci Gross slang vocab words that he was using, calling, like, a little scuffle in front of the net, greasy. I'm like, come on. Like, it just... He's trying to sound cool, you know? It, it felt like a, a little bit... <laughs> I, I, I found myself wanting more from the commentary. I found myself rolling my eyes from the commentary. Uh-huh. I think we're spoiled with some some pretty great play-by-play announcers. And last night was a little rough. A little rough. Yeah, it it, it was. It wasn't the I, – I have trouble watching Predator games outside of Willie and C-Mace calling it. 
I, I really do. And the Predators have had some great, you know, broadcasting individuals call their games. And they've been, you know, wonderful. Last night wasn't one of them. But even when you get a great, you know, game called, it's I still miss hearing Willie and C-Mates because <laughs> it's like they give you more of that in-depth about the Predators as the game's going on. They talk about what's going on with the players and you learn more about your team. Now, when they put it on the national stage, you're not going to learn much. If you're just a new fan jumping in and want to see your Predators play and you caught them last night, you're not going to learn much from a national standpoint right. about the Predators because they're, they're, they're tr trying to talk about both teams, even though it seems like they were a little bit more leaning towards St. Louis at times um, in that broadcast, but that's neither here nor there. But I, I'm with Dylan. I miss Willie and C-Mates whenever they're not calling the games for the Nashville Predators. <laughs> I will get back into your thoughts and your reaction on the Predators win last night, six to three over the St. Louis Blues. Her moneypuck.com, 99.9% .9 chance of making the playoffs. D Mates, I'm so I'm I'm so frustrated with myself that we didn't ask Willie before he ran. But I wonder <laughs> now if today Coach Willie can say that this team is in the playoffs. Or is he still worried wart Willie? Is he still worried about something? He's still worried about something. He's definitely still worried about something. <laughs> There's still that 0. 0.1%. Yeah, the 0. Willie's 0. worried about that 0.1%. You never know. So you're saying there's a chance. Because I think that's what Blues fans are saying today, because they now have a 0.1% chance of making the playoffs. So they're saying mm -hmm. there's a chance. There's um, a chance. Want to get to your phones on this coming up next. Also coming up next as well. A new Buffalo Bills mock draft. And you're probably thinking to yourself, I could give a hoot about the Buffalo Bills. I get it. I understand. But you're going to want to listen to this one. Caroline, Willie, D. Mace. Tune in to 102.5 and 106.3 The Game. This week for NCAA tournament coverage brought to you by Toyota. Ready, set, go get your Toyota today at toyota.com.
and Willie D. May say score big this spring with Lee Company and the Nashville Predators in the 10K Power Play giveaway. Enter for a chance to win a Kohler Home Generator or $10,000 toward Lee Company Home Services. That's right, a Kohler Home Generator or $10,000 toward Lee Company Home Services. Go online to LeeCompany.com slash giveaway to enter. That's LeeCompany.com slash giveaway in the 10K Power Play giveaway. Contest entries are accepted until Saturday, April 20th. Lee Company, all you need. We'll get into Ask D. Mace in just under one hour. So we'll get to your calls and your texts for D. Mace at 1230. 615-737-1025 is the phone number if you want to get in on the act. Ask D. Mace action. We've got a bunch of Predators thoughts in our text line. Reaction to the Predators 6-3 to <coughs> win over the St. Louis Blues last night. Before the game, the Predators had a 98.4% chance of making the playoffs per money do- per moneypuck.com. After that win, 99.9% chance of making the playoffs. That was the game. That was the one that the Predators had to get, and they got it. So let's get into our thoughts, and let's see if you have a thought, D-Mace. Uh, let's go to the phones. Let's get to the phones. Josh from White House, Texan, says, I usually only listen to games due to not paying for Bally or having ESPN+, Plus. but in the past, the national announcers were always biased against the Preds. Pete's the best guy to listen to. I would agree. Pete is a pretty great guy to listen to. Uh, I would just say last night, it was a whole lot of talk about things other than the game. It was, it it was, it didn't feel, you and I were talking about this at the break, D-Mace. I didn't Uh feel like I was at the game when I was sitting at home and watching on TV. uh, Willie and C-Mace will make me feel like I am there. Like I am into it. Even an opposing Mm -hmm team's broadcast like i'll feel like i'm into it i it felt very lackadaisical last night yeah it just felt like you were in a sense not not it was like you were outside of the game just mm-hmm. sort of listening to it from afar at least it, it, it may, that may not make sense but that's how it that's how i saw it it was like i wasn't really into the game Willie and C-Mace make me feel like you said, like we're there, like we're into the game. And maybe, you know, maybe we're biased because it's Willie and C-Mace. Uh, but they they do such a tremendous job at breaking things down and making it so even the novice of um, um, hockey fans can understand it. And it seemed like yesterday they were talking around hockey rather than actually talking about hockey and what was going on at every minute. And then they were a little bit one-sided at times on the, for the um, St. Louis Blues, at least in my opinion. We got a bunch of thoughts on the, on the broadcast last night. Hair Metal <laughs> Henry texts in, says, Bucci Gross is great for recaps and highlights, but not so much on a broadcast. Give me A.J. Molesco any day of the week. Mm-hmm. I would agree. I love A.J. Molesco, and I also would agree that Bucci Gross is fun for highlights he's fun at the sports center desk it's just not everybody can do everything and i didn't yeah. i didn't i didn't love the play-by-play last night no nah, and it you know it i think it's a sentiment for, you know across the board for a lot of people yeah um i'm not gonna say what everybody but it seems like a lot of texts we're getting um is about you know last night game last night's game and how it was called Another texture text into the text line says it's the same thing every single year. The Predators will get hot and then fall short in the playoffs. I don't know how you can watch what this team has done and is doing and say that this is the same old Predators because this is a different perspective. And even if the Predators do, and and D-Base, I want your thoughts on this, and Uh you set me straight if I'm completely off on this. Okay. In the past, let's say in 2022, the Predators squeaked into the playoffs. They get swept by the Colorado Avalanche. It never felt like they really had a chance. And even making the playoffs felt frustrating because it was just like, look, you're trying to run it back. You're trying to force something with the core group from the 17 and 18 team, something that's just frankly not working. If the Predators find themselves in the playoffs and they're bounced in the first round, I'm not going to say that it has the same feeling as it did in 2022. Because it's a it it's it's a completely different vision. It's a new general manager and a new coach, and you're going in a different direction. It's it's not the same. Even if the outcome is the same, 
It doesn't feel the same way. This doesn't feel like same old predators. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't feel like the same old predators. And listen, they didn't qualify for the playoffs last season. So we can't say, well, it's the same old predators just squeaking in and then end up getting put out in the playoffs early. They got put, you know, they didn't make it last year. They got put out in the playoffs early the year before that. Well, hell, I think any team that played the Colorado uh, Avalanche got put out. So it just it wasn't just the Nashville Predators, and they walk they walked into or they skated into the playoffs two years ago injured. You know, one of their best players, which is their goalie, was not in net. And they uh, so still you, just they you, weren't you, a very good team. Exactly, and they were not. This team is different from other teams. Uh, what? Will they get bounced in the playoffs in the first round? They may just just as well get bounced in the playoffs in the first round. But that doesn't mean that they're the same old Nashville Predators. This team is different. This team is di it looks different from what it did last year when they didn't qualify for the playoffs. It looks different from what it did two years ago when they did qualify for the playoffs. I think this is a better and deeper team than it has been the last three seasons. And I think the difference, too, is I'm going into this season's playoffs. And whoever the Predators play, mm -hmm. whether it's, it's the Colorado Avalanche, whether it's the Dallas Stars, whoever. I'll go into this playoffs the way that the Predators have been playing and the way that they have proven to us that they the level that they can get to, that I have a sense of optimism that they can get to the second round. I didn't have that sense of optimism in 2022. In 2022, it was like just you know four games you know put us put us out of our misery. Like you know it's it's gonna be it's gonna be a rough go. There's a shred of optimism that I have watching this team. That hey, why not? Why, why, why can't the Predators get to the second round of the playoffs? The ways that, that they've been playing against cup contenders, why not? So no, it's it's not the same old Predators. And I heard uh, I heard Joe talking about this this morning on Robbie and Joe, and he said this is the most exciting Predators team since like that that eighteen nineteen year. And I can't speak to that because I wasn't here, but I can say that this is the most exciting Predators team that I've seen since I've gotten to Nashville. And that includes the 21 team that got bounced by Carolina in a competitive series. Oh, I think we may have lost Team Ace again, but we'll we'll work on his mic at the break. And, and coming up next, Stefan Dix traded to the Houston Texans on what was that Wednesday morning? And it sent us all in a frenzy. What does this mean for the AFC South? What does it mean for the Bills? So on and so forth. But a little uh, a little change. So that situation with Stefan Diggs, and frankly, I need somebody to explain this to me because it just it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense what the Houston Texans are doing with Stefan Diggs contract. And we'll break that down coming up next. We'll get to your thoughts as well. Ask Dean Mace in 30 minutes. So get those questions in for Derek Mason. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. Caroline Willie D. Mace, 1025-1063, the game.
your Game Center update. This Game Center update is brought to you by Hiller Plumbing, Heating, Cooling, and Electrical. This is Nick Frazier. The Nashville Predators got their 44th win of the season last night, beating the St. Louis Blues 6-3. Here was head coach Andrew Burnett after last night's win. On that line, again, was great again tonight. Um, along with the O's, they're... they're you know they're they're driving our team, driving the bus here a little bit, and and then Juice was out. It was great. I mean, I don't know if he's if he's played a better game all year. The Preds are back in action tomorrow night on the road, taking on the New York Islanders. And news in MLB: According to John Heyman, right-hander for the Miami Marlins, Yuri Perez will undergo Tommy John surgery, and he will return for the 2025 season. Don't forget that there's more baseball action tonight as the Nashville Sounds take on the St. Paul Saints at First Horizon Park. Coverage begins at. 620 on 93.3 Classic Hits. And now, here's your Fox 17 weather report. I'm Fox 17 meteorologist Greg Bobas. Forecast today for us this morning all the way through 9 a.m. And then slowly warming into the upper 50s to right near 60 degrees later on this afternoon. Overall, a great day compared to the last couple. No rain in the forecast and plenty of sunshine. For more, follow us on Twitter at 1025 The Game or visit thegamenashville.com. Caroline, Willie, D. Mays, 102.5, 106.3, the game in the game Nashville app. We're streaming live on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook Live every single day. D. Mays and myself, we are on remote. Willie is en route to New York. The Predators taking on the Islanders on Saturday. And a quick turnaround taking on the Devils on Sunday on the road. We will get into Ask D. Mason in 30 minutes, so get those questions in for Derek Mason. 615-737-1025 is the phone number. We'll get into your questions in 30 minutes. But first, I want to touch on this, D. Mace, because we learned on Wednesday mid-morning that the Buffalo Bills traded Stephon Diggs to the Houston Texans for a 2025 second and a 2024 and 2025 fourth. So second next year and two fourths. Then we learned yesterday afternoon for Adam Schefter that the Houston Texans are wiping out three of the final years of Stefan Diggs' four years remaining on his contract. They give him three and a half million dollars, basically a, a bonus on to his salary this year. So he'll be making twenty two and a half million dollars this year, adding the three and a half million on to just wipe away those final three years on his contract. T. Mace, make this make sense to me. I don't know why the Texans would do this. I don't know why a team would voluntarily give up player control. Um, You know, I, I think it could be one or two reasons here. Um, because you got to understand, um, you know, even though, you know, Diggs is still playing good football, um, they didn't want to be on a hook for that contract because I think it was like 18, 19, 19, somewhere. He was going to average basically close to $19 million mm -hmm. against the cap or they would have to, had to pay him the last, you know, three years of his contract. Um, so they wanted to get out of that just in case, you know, things didn't work out well. They didn't stick they, because they were going to either have to, if it didn't work out, they were going to have to cut him mm -hmm. or they were going to have to trade him. And I don't think no one was going to take on that contract after you just took it on. So you would have had to, I believe that's how it worked. Now, if it doesn't work that way, then okay, excuse me for that. But I don't think they wanted to take on the remainder of that contract. And then he didn't, he probably, he's betting on himself because I can't see, um, and this to me, this all had to be discussed prior to the trade. Like if we make this trade, then 
we got to work out a contract, a deal where I give you the extra $3 million this year, but then void the rest of the contract because either, you know, either you can do that or we're not going to make the deal. He wanted out of Buffalo. I, I, I fully believe, oh, wholeheartedly believe he wanted out of Buffalo and he got exactly what he wanted. But Houston, they're doing it because they're going for it this year. That's one reason. Two, they didn't want to take on the rest of his contract, so that's why they redid it, I believe. And then three, this is a, I believe it's a Tank Dale insurance. When they lost Tank Dale, their passing game suffered somewhat. They went from two, you know, playmaking receivers to one. Um, now, they had other guys on the team, but you take away an explosive um, Tank Dale, that does something to your offense. So I think the, the Stephon Diggs trade was insurance but Tank Dale, if he doesn't come back fully healthy or if it takes him another year to really get back to form, which means if that is indeed the case, we don't need you next year. And if you ball out, then maybe we can rework the deal. But if you don't, we can let you go and let you walk. But I, but I think I truly believe them reworking the deal of them voiding the rest of the contract. It's a win for the Houston Texans and it's a win for Stefan Diggs because if Stefan Diggs balls out, now we can go into free agency asking for more money. If he doesn't, now Houston's not on the hook for the remainder of the contract. You lost me at Tank Dell Insurance, I will say, because I don't think that a team, a smart team, would pay $22.5 million in a second-round pick just for insurance and just for one year of insurance. From mm -hmm. Stefan Diggs' perspective, though, I think this is a great gamble on himself because, like you said, if he balls out this season – then he gets an opportunity to sign another contract in an inflated wide receiver market. Mm -hmm. When he initially signed his contract before, you know, Justin Jefferson will sign his deal and Jamar Chase will sign his deal. And what did he sign before Christian Kirk? I can't Ooh, remember. Stephon Diggs. Yeah. Well, his initial contract, it may have been right after Christian Kirk's. I can't well, remember, but but still, the receiver market has yes. ballooned even even since then. So I think this mm -hmm. is a good move for Stefan Diggs because he'll be going into his 31-year-old season with mm -hmm. a new deal and in an inflated market. So I think that makes sense for Stefan Diggs, and it's really motivation for him. And I think from the Houston Texans' perspective, it tells me one of uh, a few things. Like you said, this is a go-for-it year. The, the uh -huh. Texans think that they can win the Super Bowl this year. And I'll, frankly, I don't know if I disagree that they can win the Super Bowl this year, but also it tells me that they don't trust Stefan Diggs. I don't even they, think it I don't think I, it has anything to do with the trust, honestly. Well then why want to get out of that contract? If you if you don't think that he's going to become a problem, mm -hmm. then why would you want to incentivize him to ball out this year and like dangle a carrot of a second contract? Mm -hmm. And why give up player control if you don't think that he's eventually going to become a problem? And with that, if you don't trust the player and you mm -hmm. only want a player, or at least, you know, you're only now have him under contract for one year, trading a second round pick for one year, mm -hmm. that doesn't add up to me. The Houston Texans perspective, it just doesn't make sense to me. It feels like you're going all chips in the middle for this season when you really don't have to. Well, it's it's not it's not about a all chips for now. Listen, they are going for it this season, but it doesn't yeah. mean we're going for it and neglecting the future. They have the one thing that everybody wants. They have their quarterback, so they mm -hmm. will never be neglecting their future. They're saying we have an opportunity to really distance ourselves from the AFC South, as well as from some of these other teams not named Kansas City that are in AFC. Now, I don't think they totally distance themselves from, you know, the Baltimore Ravens mm -hmm. or um, or the Buffalo Bills. I don't think they distance themselves that much from them, but now they've jumped in the arena with them. They're in the same playground with these, you know, three or four teams outside of um, Kansas City. But to me, this was a let's do it. Let's try to do it this year because we're not worried about that. We're not necessarily worried about the second round pick next year. Why? Because we're not a rebuilding team. 
We're not rebuilding. Our rebuilding has been the last three years. And we hit this year because we got a all-world quarterback and we got a defensive player on the edge that seems like he's going to be all-world too. That's why our team looks like looks the way it does now. We can afford to go get Stefan Diggs or go a second round next year and hope that it works and not be scared to lose the second round draft peak from, from the next following year because to them, it's not about having a second round pick or not. It's about positioning them themselves in the situation where they are closer to Kansas City than further away from Kansas City. And right now, they are closer to Kansas City than they are farther away than Kansas City. When they made that move for say Stephon Diggs, when they went and got the defensive players that they got last um, this offseason, when they went and got Joe Miss Mixon, yeah. they did that to get closer to Kansas City. And they are closer to Kansas City, but they're still in the playground with those three or four teams outside of Kansas City that 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 is going to compete either for that 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 number two spot or that number three spot headed into the playoffs. So to me, it's Listen, let's go for it now. We'll worry about the second round pick next year. We're not in rebuild mode. We don't necessarily need it. If we had it, great, but we don't necessarily need it. But what we're doing is if he balls out, we don't want to be on the hook for it. We can work work a deal or we can let him walk. If he doesn't ball out, we still can re-sign him to a deal, but we don't have to hold on to the 18, the 19, and the close to 20 million you would have to pay him over the next three seasons. We just don't want to have to pay Stefan Diggs the next three seasons as he ages. That's why we voided the contract, gave him extra money, and we want to win now, meaning the Houston Texans. Then why trade the second round pick for him? See, that's what I I don't get because in it in individually, we don't want to uh-huh. pay Stefan Diggs and we're going for it this year. Okay. Then you're going to trade a second round pick for a player that you only want one year out of? And let's say Stefan Diggs has a monster year because well, I don't really believe him. that. Are you going to re-sign him to a three to four year deal when he's 31 years old at 20 plus million dollars a season? When mm-hmm. you now have to compete with 31 other teams in the National Football League when you could have just had him under contract for a lower dollar amount anyway? The And, and, and you're right in regards to that. But and I, I think... It, I believe in the Texans' mind, it's not necessarily about what we're going to do next year. They're worried about next year's draft when that comes around. They may end up making more moves to get that second-round draft pick. It's not set in stone that they will not have a draft pick in the second round next year. I know they've given up their second-round draft pick for next year, but then they can make a move, trade a player, and get a second-round draft pick back. Sure. Yeah. Next year for the one they gave up this year. So I'm not too I'm not too worried about the sick. I think we're missing it when we just look at the second round pick for next year. Let's just look at this year. They are essentially, like you said, like we've discussed, they are going for it. But they know that even even by going for it this year, it doesn't mean that we can't then be in the same position next year with somebody else and still have an opportunity to win a Super Bowl. I don't think they're thinking about next year's draft when they're when they made that move for Stefan Diggs. I don't think they were either, clearly, because they gave up a second round pick just for one year. And I would agree that I think that Houston is in a window. As mm-hmm. long as CJ Stroud is playing like he played last season, and as long as they have all of their young contributors, like they are going to be in a Super Bowl window. Absolutely. It just all of the pieces does it doesn't really make sense to me, because if you're going for it this year, like you don't have to just go for it this year. Like you said, as long as you have CJ Stroud, Mm -hmm. you can be in a window. They can be in that window in 2025. So wouldn't you want to have Stefan Diggs under contract to run it back in 2025? Or are you afraid of Stefan Diggs becoming such a problem this season that you don't want him to have that comfort of those extra three years on the deal. And no, I don't know they, if that's the truth or not, no. but if that is the case, why even trade for him in the first place? If they thought they were going to, my thing is, if they thought he was going to be a problem, they wouldn't have signed him. I think that organization with that head coach, the GM, 
where they sit now with the young quarterback, if they truly in their hearts felt he was going to be a problem and he was going to disrupt, you know, sort of the zen of the quarterback, they wouldn't have went out and got him. They wouldn't have. I don't believe they would. I would hope they wouldn't. But they, I don't think they're thinking about that. I think they've talked to enough people. They've talked to Stefan Diggs that they, that that part isn't a problem for them. What's a problem is him getting older. So they don't want to be held to that contract. Now, if they choose to sign her to another contract next year, then that's what they will do. But at this present moment, they're not thinking about him next year and, and whether he's a part of the team or not. They're thinking about what can he do for us this season? And sometimes if you if you want to make that that drastic jump, then you're going to have to give up something drastic to do it. And they gave up a second round pick because they want to make that jump this year. They feel they're close enough. They feel playing the Baltimore Ravens had they had another bona fide receiver because Tank Dale was hurt, then they probably feel that they would have been in that game. They probably could have won that game. But because they didn't have that secondary um, scoring from 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 the number two receiver, they had to go out and get insurance. They had to go out and make sure that if Tank Dale doesn't come back a hundred percent. He may he may end up playing this year. I think he will. But will he look like the same Tank Dale um, this year than he did last year? More than likely, from history, he won't. It's going to take him another following year to get back to where he was. So if that's the case, I need to go and get insurance. I need to get insurance to make sure we have another bona fide receiver to, to you know to 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 tag team with Nico Collins and our quarterback. So we will not be deficient in any area. If they don't go out and get um, Stephon Diggs and Tank Dale doesn't come back fully healthy, this team is battling hard to win the AFC South. Now we're getting Stephon Diggs. They become the front runners. That's expensive insurance. Sometimes $23 hey, million dollars in a second insurance round Insurance can be expensive. It can be expensive. I don't know if he's as much insurance as he is in addition. Like, because I think I mean, he's an addition, yes, but I think it's an insurance too, just in case Tank Dale doesn't come back or if it takes him time to get back to where he left off. It just still, there's just something missing with it to me, I think. Mm -hmm. Because, like, like, I just, I, if you're so concerned about Stefan Diggs and the age and the contract, why do you trade for him? If you only want one year of Stefan Diggs, why do you trade for him? It just, it, how many times have you seen an NFL team trade a, a pick as high as a second round pick just for one year of a player? I mean, it's obviously, it I don't happens. think you've ever really truly seen it. I mean, but now they has... went out and got players. Teams have went out and got players, but I don't know about giving up a second round pick for a that player. Second round pick and twenty three million dollars just for one year. When I think the Texan Super Bowl window <laughs> is much longer than just one year. I think there's something that it's just it just doesn't add up to me from the Texans' perspective of why give up player control of a great player that at least. I think the Texans view as the missing piece for a, a potential Super Bowl run, because why make the move if you don't think that he's going to be that piece for you to make a Super Bowl run? You know what I mean? No, Just I understand it. not adding up. I understand it. Uh, I, I would have loved to, if Tank Dale didn't break his fibula last season, would they would have, would they been in the market um, to get a Stefan Diggs? Because it just seemed like this came out of the blue. Like it was like, Okay, at least this is how I think about it. Okay, we're evaluating Tank Dale. He's in the facility all the time because he's rehabbing. Yeah, man, we need to, we need to make sure we go get some another bona fide guy, either through the draft or or make a trade or through free agency. And obviously, they probably looked at the free agent wide receiver and was like, "Nah, this is not going to help us." So we got to make we got to we got to go down another road to get the guy that we want, and that was trading for a disgruntled player that didn't want to be in Buffalo anymore because I guarantee you if Stefan Diggs wanted to be in Buffalo Buffalo would have kept him but totally. I don't think he wanted to be in Buffalo so they had to get rid of him and why not if you're Houston if they're ready to get rid of him why not go and make a trade for him when you know 
in your own house that you're dealing with injuries that this guy Tank Dale may not come back fully healthy and ready to go for the season. That was critical to their quarterback last year, having Nico and Dale. You take one of those guys out of the equation, that does something to the quarterback. Now you add in a Stephon Dig. Now you're not so much worried about whether Tank Dale is going to be ready day one or if it's going to take him day 50 to get back to where he left off. And it makes total sense to me why the Texans traded for Stefan Diggs. They're uh-huh. in go for it mode. They feel like he is that next addition to make their offense even more explosive. Like the move itself, I get it. I totally see it. It's the new move with wiping three years off of the contract that I just it, it, that just doesn't make sense to me. Because I don't, I, I don't think that they do that if they wholeheartedly trust in Stefan Diggs on the field or off the field. Because we talked about this whenever the Texans made that move was, mm-hmm. look, Stefan Diggs caused a fit in Minnesota. Then they shipped him out of Minnesota to Buffalo. Mm-hmm. Then he caused a fit in Buffalo. They shipped him out. And they're now eating $31 million in order to just get rid of him. So if the Houston Texans did wholeheartedly trust that Stefan Diggs would not cause a fuss like he did in Minnesota and Buffalo, I don't know why you would want to get rid of three years on the contract when you could lock him in. Because you don't, you don't want to be held to that money in the age and wide receiver. He's getting, he's not getting any younger and they probably looked at the second half of the season and thought, okay, man, it does look like he's slowing down a little bit, but he still can give us what we need. Because again, Tank Dale is the is the question mark. So if Tank Dale is it a hundred percent and ready to go, we need to have somebody. They don't have nobody outside of Tank Dale. I mean, I know they got Meacham, but hell, Meacham been just as injured. Um, Joe Mechie. Yeah, Mechie, Mechie, not Meacham. Uh, Mechie, he he hasn't been on the field much either. I think he just got back last year because he was dealing with an ailment. Um, he, he's been going through cancer treatment. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. So he's been dealing with his helmet. So it's like they're, even though he has come back, they still have to have insurance for two guys that they don't know what they're going to get out of this season. So you went from having a bona fide receiving core to, to prior to getting Stefan Diggs to really only having Nico Collins. Well, we need to go get another guy. At least that's how I see it. I, I think totally. that's why they end up make, making a move. The move makes sense. The uh-huh. trade makes sense. It's the altering of the contract that just doesn't He's, really he's an older player. That's what I, I believe. He's an agent player, and they don't want to pay him that money. Then why trade for him? That's my thing. Is, because is, the quarterback needed help. The and quarterback not, needed another guy. Then why not get a receiver in free agency? Because the free agent pool of receivers, the free agent, the free agency pool of receivers is trash right now. It's not good. Um, the only person out there, I think, is what Tyler Boyd. He may be still out there. Well, like um, it's not like the Titans pounced on Calvin Ridley day one of free agency. Like if the Texans wanted to sign Calvin Ridley, he was there for the taking. He was there for this. You're absolutely right, but but that's a different scenario. That's the guy you got to sign to a long term deal. Stefan Diggs isn't a guy you have to sign to a long-term deal. You take the deal that he had in Buffalo, you bring it over to Houston, and you find a way to, you know, void the last three years of the contract. And Houston has figured it out. They found a way to void the last three years. So it's just, it's what it basically is. Just look at it like this. It's basically a franchise tag. That's all it is. A franchise tag for one player Yes, you had to give up a second round pick, but I don't think Houston is thinking about that second round pick. They're thinking this is a franchise tag for us. What's the franchise tag for a receiver? 20 something million dollars, mid 20s, 22, 23. That's exactly what he got. So it's just a, that's just, it's a franchise tag to them. And if the uh, Texans go out and win the Super Bowl this year, then Mm -hmm. no, they'll be, will adopt the St. Louis Rams F them picks. We don't (laughs) care about that second round pick because that paid dividends. But if they don't, and they still find themselves, let's say, in the AFC Championship game or the divisional round of the playoffs, because I expect the Texans to be making a run this upcoming season. Mm-hmm. Stephon Diggs has 1,400 yards. Balls out. What do you do in 2025? Well, you let him. You let him. Then then you allow him to hit the market. And 
if you want to get back into the sweepstakes of getting the Stefan Diggs, then you can offer a contract that is beneficial for the team. You can do that then without as many years. It end up being essentially a three year deal, a three year contract, but really a one to two year deal. Crazy. Mm hmm. Wild. And if the Texans win the Super Bowl, then I will look like an absolute doofus. And if they don't, Nick Casario might be the one looking <laughs> like a doofus. Uh, but I want to get into your, your questions for D Mays. Ask D Mays coming up next. 615 737 1025 is the phone number. And we've got a pretty great giveaway for the best question for D Mays. I will reveal what that is coming up next. Get those questions in for D Mays. We'll take your calls and your texts. 615 737 1025 is the phone number. Caroline, Willie, D. Mays, we're brought to you by Zen Sports. Start earning cash rewards on your bets today. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-889-9789. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older and in Tennessee to bet. Happy Friday to everyone. Hey, we got some games tonight. Women's Final Four. Duke, I mean, Duke, I was about to say Duke. We got UConn, we got Iowa, we got uh, South Carolina. Um, who is South Carolina playing? I don't even know, but they're playing someone NC that – NC State. There we go. South Carolina is playing NC State. NC State has both the men's and the women's in the Final Four, as well as UConn. So if you're going to be making your bets, you need to do it with our partners Zen Sports. And I'm happy and excited to tell you, as I have been for the last two to three months, about their introduction promotion available to all the new customers here in Tennessee. It's the No Danger First Wager. When you sign up for a Zen Sports account, you will receive up to $1,000 No Danger First Wager when you place your first bet on Zen Sports. You will be reimbursed for the amount of your bet if it loses up to $1,000 plus. Zen Sports has launched a VIP program for the Premier Betters of Tennessee. If you think you might qualify, then listen up, people. The VIP program is by invite only. So if you feel that your Zen Sports play qualifies for the VIP consideration, please check out the program details and apply at zensports.com slash VIP. No other sports book will offer you a premier sports betting experience with 24-7 top-tier customer support and bigger and better action than Zen Sports. So what are you waiting for, betters? Get going and download their app at zensports.com today. That's Zen Sports. Betting just got better. And remember, gambling problems call 1-800-889-9789. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 years or older to bet here in Tennessee.
Teammates. He played 15 years in the NFL. A quick throw. Touchdown, Derek Mason. He had over 12,000 receiving yards. Big field, and there he goes. 80 yards for the touchdown. And now you can ask him anything. Have a question about football or life? Now's your time to ask D Mace. We'll welcome you in. <laughs> now on Caroline, Willie, and D Mace. On 1025 and 1063, The Game and the Game Nashville app. those questions in for Derek Mason 615-737-1025 is the phone number if you've got a question for D Mace we'll take your calls we'll take your texts and the best question for D Mace will win a pair of tickets to go to the Geico 500 at the Talladega Super Speedway on Sunday April 21st and I know that is the weather is going to be beautiful it's going to be a great race so get those questions in for D Mace Eric is going to kick us off our phone lines are driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com what's up Eric hey guys I appreciate that you can take me out of the running because I'm not going to be able to go but that definitely sounds like it's going to be fun and I definitely <laughs> somebody that's going to be able to go they can really appreciate and enjoy it more than I will and I could have jokes for you, and actually, it's not that I don't, I do, but I'm actually going to go with the trivia question for you, Derek, before I get to what I want to ask you. Okay. Okay. In the, I saw this earlier this week. In the modern NFL history, there's been one NFL head coach that has drafted three quarterbacks in the first round. Name me that head coach. Modern-day coach that has drafted three quarterbacks in the first round? Yeah. Gosh. Oh man, I'm trying to think. I can't. I I don't know. Well, of it. I, I would I'll say give you, Bill, I'll give, I'll give Bill you Belichick, but he's hint. not coaching anywhere. Well, this this coach is is is, is also not coaching anywhere, well, anywhere. But if you think about it, you can get this coach. Oh man, you gonna have to tell me. It is Jeff Fisher. He drafted. I, you know, uh, I was thinking about. I yeah, so you got. Steve McNair, Steve Jake McNair. Walker. No, no, no. Steve McNair, uh-huh. Vince Young, and Jared Goff. You're right. Oh, Jared Goff. Yes. Yeah, I was yeah, thinking yeah. Jake and, Locker, but he had already no, left. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. He had already left. And, of course, yes. uh, it was Sean McVay that unfortunately developed him. And Jeff, and Jeff Fisher tried to take credit for it, but we won't oh, get wow. into that. wow. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> okay. But here's, here's my question for, for you, uh, d Mace. You know, uh-huh. one of the things I think is so hilarious is everybody talks about how people's draft stocks rises and falls and everything like that. And, of course, before last year, uh, everybody was talking about J.J. McCarthy being either a second-round or third-round quarterback draft at best. Then after he won the national championship, I was still hearing everybody saying, well, they think he's either going to go middle second round or at best late first round. But now in the last few weeks, there are people saying he's the second-best quarterback behind Caleb Williams. I just don't get it. It's just – and there's, and I think it's just a lot of GMs and people blowing smoke up everybody's butt. And of course, you got, um, of course, Jim, um, Jim Harbaugh, Jim Harbaugh. Saying that, yeah, yeah, that uh, he thinks that, oh yeah, he's it great. Of course, I think he's doing this so he can work a trade so he can get draft picks. But I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. Do you really think he's that good, or do you are you just not stoning him? And he, you just think like me. I just think they just people are just blowing smoke up everybody's butt. I just don't get it. All the love to slurp on that. I'm just not totally convinced and sold on J.J. McCarthy. Maybe it turned out great. I don't know. But I just want to get your thoughts on that. As always, good talk to you guys. Y'all take care and have a great weekend. You're the best, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate the call. So Eric was saying, do I think, do I believe all the J.J. McCarthy hype? Listen, I, I think J.J. is a good core, a good player. Uh, and, and, and every time I'm watching something um, and they're discussing J.J. McCarthy, it's, oh, he has the clutch gene. Well, that ain't going to win me no game. That ain't going to win me a lot of games just because you have the clutch gene. What if the clutch gene ain't working that game? Then what happens? I need some other things. I need to see your accuracy. I need to see your leadership. I need to see, you know, if you're going – if you're going to, you know, um, step into that pass when you know that that defensive end or that defensive tackle is barreling in on you. I need to see, can you manage and control and win games at this level? 
I don't know that yet. Did he win at the collegiate level? Absolutely, he did win at the collegiate level. But if you watch him, Jim Harbaugh is excellent at not putting everything on the quarterback. You can look at it when he was with, even though he had one of the greatest quarterbacks in, in, in college football at the time in Stanford. They ran the football and they played great defense. When he got to um, San Francisco, what did they do? Run the football and play great defense. Then he gets to Michigan. What does Michigan do? Run the football and play great defense. And their quarterback just don't mess the game up for us. He finally got to a guy that wasn't going to mess the game up for him. And that was J.J. McCarthy. Again, do I believe J.J. McCarthy is a good quarterback? I do. But the hype? I'm not believing the hype. We saw the same thing last year, Carolyn, with our quarterback here, Will Levis. They hyped him up so much so that people thought he was going to be the first player chosen or the second player, and he ends up slipping until the second round. Now, I think the Titans got them a pretty good quarterback by waiting till you know, by him slipping in the second round and then being able to get him. But we're seeing the same playbook over again that we have seen not just last year, but in previous years. Yeah, and the argument of, well, he had success in college. A lot of quarterbacks had success exactly. in college that didn't work out in the NFL. Like, where is Mac Jones playing right now? Like, he's a backup. Uh -huh. And Mac Jones quarterbacked what you could argue is one of the best teams in college football history. But, uh, you know, I look at J.J. McCarthy. Could he be the next Tom Brady? Sure. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, great. And then Michigan is known as QBU for the rest, <laughs> for the rest of the season. <laughs> But I look at how Michigan found success this past season. And I think J.J. McCarthy is like fifth or sixth on the list of the reasons why mm -hmm. Michigan won a national championship. So I'm not buying the hype, but we will chat with Tim Hasselbeck at the top of the hour. So I want to get mm -hmm. Tim's thoughts on that if he's buying the J.J. McCarthy hype because I know he loves Drake May. Uh, Billy is on the line with a question for D. Mace. What's up, Billy? Hey, D. Mace, Caroline. D. Mace, hey, I'm Billy. Saying, you, should be, uh, you should be in the Hall of Fame already. Let's start by that. Well, uh, thank you, Billy. I appreciate that. Uh, I, my, I'm going a little over the top here. The Titans, uh, the biggest problems for the Titans in the last 10 years, in my opinion, has been offensive line. They have not addressed, for the most part, any of that in the free agency other than a uh, center, I believe. Um, I think that they think uh, Mr. Callahan's the older Callahan is going to coach his offensive line up uh, and make them better than they actually are. Uh, we've heard that for the last 10 years. And my question is, do you know if anyone uh, has ever drafted only offensive linemen in one draft? I want the Titans to take every single pick they have <laughs> and draft <laughs> offensive linemen and have a plethora of offensive linemen. That way, if they miss on one, they got another one. That's my question. Can we do that, and should we do that? Thank you for your call, Billy. Thank you, I don't, Will. I don't think that that feeling or that, like, him wanting the Titans to do that is so out of left field because that's how bad the offensive line was last season. Yeah, I don't think so either. Um <laughs> Billy, first of all, thank you um, for um, suggesting that I should be in the Hall of Fame. I believe I should be, but that's for a different, um, I different conversation for a different time. And so does my um, host. Um, Caroline believes it as well. Um, but I, I understand why Billy, like, listen, Billy want offensive linemen. That's what he wants because yeah. um, he doesn't want to see his quarterback on the sideline or, you know, being put on a, a golf cart carted out of um off the field because he's injured and i don't want that either we've seen it for the last two seasons where because of the offensive line inefficiencies of blocking that both quarterbacks have found themselves on the injury on the injury list and, and, and missing games um i don't know when the last time a team has ever drafted all offensive linemen i need to look that up but I think there was one year where and it might have been within the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, the Indianapolis coach, because remember, their offensive line was hoard so much so Horrible. that um, Andrew decided to Andrew Luck decided to retire because he was just getting beat up. 
and they went out and they, you know, signed, they went out and drafted offensive linemen, um, you know, to, to, to help solidify the offensive line, offensive line. Will the Titans do that? No, I don't think they will do it. Um, unfortunately, Bill, Billy, um, but, um, it needs to start with a left tackle. Uh, I don't care. Honestly, really, listen, I don't care who is there at that point, whether it's neighbors or Harrison, and I think Harrison be gone, or Dunze, you need a left tackle. That's a dire need. It's not a, oh, yeah, we need a left tackle. Let's go get one. No, it's, oh, hell yeah, we need a left tackle. So if Alt's there and you that's your number one guy, then you take him. But again, we've talked. If you have Alt and uh, Fashnu or, you know, one of these other left tackles, because J.C. Latham plays more right tackle than left tackle. If you have one of these other left tackles and they're close in regards to their grade, how you have them graded, then maybe you will be able to pass on an Alt if a, if a neighbors is there. But if you don't have anyone in this class, why pass up? a guy that you desperately need. That's my thing. You don't pass up a desperate need and a guy that many consider, you know, he's, he's, he's NFL ready. He's ready to go. You plug him in. You don't have to worry about him. You know, obviously if there's injury involved, yeah. But if you, if he's not injured, you don't have to worry about this guy from what people are saying for the next 10, 12 years. So if that's the case and you need that position, you go out and draft that the guy that's that's the best at that position. And right now it's alt. If the Titans decide to take a tackle with the first, with their first round pick and their second round pick, I got no problems with that. Oh Uh, yeah. Me either. I can't, I can't uh, sit here and argue it. Why? Because the offensive line has been their Achilles heel for the last two seasons. It's that bad. And you still have three areas in the offensive line that have not gone addressed. Like if Joe Alt's your left tackle, that's great. And I feel, mm-hmm. I would be elated if the Titans went Joe Alt at left tackle at seven. You still need a right tackle too. Yeah. Like you got a center and you got a left guard, and that's all you've got. More questions for D Mays coming up next. 615-737-1025 is the phone number. Best question for D Mays. We'll win a pair of tickets to, to the Geico 500 at the Talladega Super Speedway on Sunday, April 21st.
tickets to give away to the Geico 500 at the Talladega Super Speedway on Sunday, April 21st. So be the first person with the correct answer to this trivia question, and you will be going to the Geico 500 at the Talladega Super Speedway. 615-737-1025 is the phone number. Call, do not text, and the trivia question is, who is the most recent driver to get their first Career Cup S- Series win at Talladega? First, or excuse me, the most recent driver to get their first Career Cup win Series win at Talladega. Be the first person with the correct answer. And it'll be going to the Geico 500 at the Talladega Super Speedway. Back into your questions for D. Mace. Wes and Hermitage checks in. Our friend Wes, who we have to thank uh-huh. for the hash brown casserole. Thank he you, Wes, for the hash brown casserole. It. He sent it in. He sent it in again. And he sent us some hash brown casserole again earlier this week. So shout out to Wes. Mm-hmm. But his question for D. Mace is, with all of the moves so far, where do the Titans sit in the rankings in the AFC South, in your opinion? With all the moves that the Titans have made, where are they ranked? In the AFC period or AFC South? AFC South, he asks. AFC South, um, I think... At this particular moment, um, Houston's still number one. I think they are they are closer to Jacksonville than not. Um, you look at what uh, what Indianapolis, um, them signing some of their players back, um, them having their quarterback come back last year's injury. I think that's going to be the big thing for them. How is he going to come back off of a shoulder injury? Um, so I'm kind of putting them like on stand still on hold right now to coach. But I think if you're just talking about the Houston Texans, Jacksonville Jaguars and the Titans, I think the moves that the Titans have made, I put them uh, more so on par with Jacksonville. Um, they're not quite on par with Houston just yet. Um, but I think they, they are closer because listen, before the free agency start, they were at rock bottom. They, they just were the Titans. They had depth problem. They didn't have that bona fide second wide receiver uh, because of obviously trailing Burks. He just hasn't, you know, and hopefully this is the year and I'm rooting for the young man. Hopefully this is the year that he does it. But prior to the draft, I mean, prior to the free agency, they had nothing really. Um, So now at the free agency with the guys that you wouldn't get more, you know, mostly on the defensive side of the ball with the exception of uh, uh, um, um, uh, the center uh, Cushman and then them going to get Pollard and um, Calvin Ridley. I think it puts them on par right now with Jacksonville. Um, Jacksonville may be a tad bit ahead of them, however you want to split hairs, but I think it puts it more on par with Jacksonville than Houston. So I would say, you know, they're right. They're right below Houston um, um, in regards to where I place them. If I say, how does the season end right now? I think, Jacksonville, I mean, I think Houston's number one. Tennessee's two, but Jacksonville is not too far behind. They may end up probably closely the same record, uh, I believe, right now as we stand. And this division is so intriguing because you have three quarterbacks going into their into their quote-unquote sophomore season. Yes. And you know, that second year, you could take a massive leap. You could, leap, you could have that sophomore slump. So that's going to be an interesting storyline to watch with this division moving forward. Skyler checks in. Is D hop worth more than 12 and a half million or are these other receivers just that much more overpaid? Did we lose Caroline? Oh, can you hear me? Or did they? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Caroline. Can I? Skyler asks, is D hop worth more than 12 and a half million dollars or are these other receivers that much more overpaid? Um, I, I don't think it's it's about necessarily being overpaid. I just think it's, you know, unfortunately, you know, when D-Hop entered uh, free agency, uh, he came off a subpar season and he's getting older and he was injured. Um, so to me, that's what caused, you know, him to, you know, get the contract that he has now. Um, I don't think the other wide receivers are overpaid. I just think in in D Hop's case, uh, it's market value for him um, because he he held out long enough. Not that he was holding out, but I'm saying he was on the market long enough mm-hmm. for teams that they were going to pay him the twenty 
20 plus million. They could have, but no one wanted to, you know, go that high. The Titans came in just below two, you know, 20 million, which I thought was fair market value um, for D hop. So I don't see, you know, him being underpaid this year. I think if he was to go into free agency this year, it would be right around the same thing. It's fair market value. But that doesn't mean that I think everybody else is overpaid. I don't think yeah, I don't think these guys are overpaid. The top, the top tier guys. I'm not talking about anybody else. I'm talking about the top tier guys. I don't think they got overpaid. I think they got compensated for the work that they have done and teams believe they will do. You're worth what the market says you're worth. Exactly. I, I thought that Christian Kirk was overpaid whenever Jacksonville gave him that deal. Uh-huh. And Jacksonville ended up being the smart ones in that mm-hmm. deal because they, they got underpaid for Kirk. it. At at this point now, yeah. Exactly. I would say Christian Kirk is underpaid. It is wild how massive the, the shifts in markets, especially the wide receiver markets, have been. Mm-hmm. Anyways, I know that you uh, you wish you probably could have been a part of this. <laughs> if I was <laughs> born in 1984 or 94 rather than 74, then yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, appreciate everyone for getting those questions in for D Mays. Coming up next, Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst, will join us. We had a question about JJ McCarthy. I've been asking myself that same question. Is the hype real for JJ McCarthy? Is it just draft smoke? We'll ask Tim Hasselbeck, plus his thoughts on the Stefan Diggs to Houston move. Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst, will join us coming up next. Caroline Willie D Mace. Tune in to 94.9 The Fan today as the Nashville Sounds take on the St. Paul Saints at First Horizon Park. Free game at 6.20 p.m., first pitch at 6.35 with coverage also available on 94.9 The Fan app and at 94.9thefan.com. Sounds baseball on 94.9 The Fan presented by Twin Peaks Family Leisure and Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning.
Caroline, Willie, D. Mays, 102.5-1063, The Game and The Game Nashville app. We are streaming live on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook Live every single day. We are broadcasting from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios, home of the $99 yearly Beehive membership, where Buzz is always about great service. A lot of news in the NFL. It is officially draft month. Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst and Ensworth head coach, joins us now. Tim, appreciate you for, appreciate you for being flexible with our schedule this week, joining us a little bit later this week. For the big news of the week, Stefan Diggs traded from Buffalo to Houston. Now, I cannot quite make sense of why Houston just got rid of the final three years of the contract trading a second round pick for just one year of Stefan Diggs and $22.5 million feels awfully rich. Yeah, help me make sense of this, Tim. What did you make of the Texans' decision to do that with the contract? Yeah, I I agree with you. I was surprised by it. It didn't seem like it necessarily made a ton of sense. And from a, well, why wouldn't you just keep it there? You know, have them uh, under contract. This is probably, you know, not a one year expectation for you in terms of what you think your window is. You do have a second year quarterback. Obviously you think he's really good. Uh, like, I guess when I look at the, the moves in general by Houston, it feels to me like, okay, yeah, we have the young quarterback who's inexpensive. Let's surround him with as much talent as we can right now, because that's how teams try to make it to the Super Bowl and, and hopefully win it. So, you know, I think that, um, I think maybe it was maybe that's what was necessary, you know, in order to get Stephon Diggs and have Stephon Diggs be happy once he's in your building, um, because I think that you know he's probably had a history of not necessarily being the best employee when he was unhappy about something. So, look, that's my guess in terms of why the contract situation has worked itself out the way that it has. Um, I still think it's probably good for Houston. Maybe they you know, are, you know, in the process of reworking something else or saying like, Hey, um, you know, we'll have the opportunity if you catch 110 balls, we have the opportunity while you're here for us to renegotiate something with you. So, um, yeah, I think it's, and I would just would say that from this perspective of like the winners in this, but I think Houston's a winner in it because they're adding a really good player. Um, with a young quarterback who, you know, had a good year with probably receivers not as good as Stephon Diggs. And then Stephon Diggs is the winner. I mean, he, he's the winner because he gets to go play with a really good young quarterback. And if it isn't great, look, he's still going to be a valuable, you know, wide receiver uh, on the market. We're talking with Tim Hasselbeck. And yeah, the move itself, adding Stephon Diggs, I think that's a slam dunk for Houston. It's just you know, kind of the, the contract thing I've had questions about, but just with the addition of Stefan Diggs in Houston, where do you put the Texans in the hierarchy of the AFC? Well, they got better, right? So they were, um, you know, they, they weren't Kansas City. They haven't been Baltimore. Um, they're chasing those teams. I don't think adding Stefan Diggs necessarily means that, you know, they're right there with them now, but – I think it gets them closer for sure. Because when you look at Houston and you look at them last year where what with the young receivers that played well, and look, maybe Tank Dell was better than we thought that he was coming into the season. He had a great year. But when you – like I don't know how you, you could look at the addition of Stephon Diggs and not think that is a true proven number one wide receiver, a guy that could catch double-digit touchdowns, a guy that could catch over 100 balls. And so with that being the case, yeah, they it gets them a step closer for sure to the Kansas City Chiefs and the Baltimore Ravens. We talk with Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst and head coach of the Innsworth Tigers. Um, I, I, I thought the Diggs um, trade uh, was a trade, and, and I've told Caroline this, um, um, Tim, that I think it was because this was something that no one saw happen, no one saw coming. And it just seemed like it was just out of the blue. You wake up, you know, go throughout your day, and then, oh, my goodness, Stephon Diggs has been traded. <laughs> I think a part of this has to do with Tank Dale. Whether, because their offense, when they when they had Tank Dale and Nico Collins, 
obviously in a tight end. This was a flourishing offense. Then you lose one of those weapons and you can't play the way that you normally play, especially going up against a Baltimore Ravens team, the way you want to play as far as throwing the football because you won, you know, one target down or one playmaker down. You don't know how he's going to come back off of the broken fibula. And if he does, how long will it take? Well, we don't have time to wait. We got our quarterback. Mm -hmm. We need another playmaker. And we don't Mm -hmm. need him for a long term. We just need him for a short term. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I believe that's the reason why they went out and got a step on Diggs because a lot of it is, some of it is predicated on whether Tank Dale comes back the way he left last season. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, it's, it's true. It's fair. It's, and when you consider, how good he was and the severity of the injury, it makes sense that you'd want to protect yourself. And I think that there's, I, I think that, I think you see that all the time. I think the teams that get themselves into trouble are the teams that don't protect themselves. And they say, Oh yeah. I mean, like he'll be good. He'll be back. And you see me like, yeah, you know what? Like coming off a big injury, you know, he's getting limited reps in training camp. And ah, you know what? The leg blew up again. And, now he's going to be out for a few weeks. And, and so, yeah, I, I don't think there's any question that you look at it and you say, okay, well, like, how do we, how do we protect ourselves a little bit? Think about the, the Baltimore Ravens last year. Mm-hmm. Look at Odell Beckham Jr. Like, what was, his, what was his true role, you know, on that football team? Like, was he brought in to be some type of true, you know, every down player, every week player? Not really, but – they knew between the injuries they had with guys like Bateman in the past and the fact that Zay Flowers was not truly a, a proven commodity as a rookie, it was like, listen, you better have some guys there that you're going to be able to turn to when a guy hits a rookie wall or a guy gets injured. And so, yeah, I think it's kind of a mark of a good team to say, yeah, look, look we're going to address this as well, even though it's not necessarily a need, assuming everyone's healthy. Now, why do you, Tim, why do you think, um, one, why do you believe J.J. McCarthy supposedly is rising in the stock, but it seems like Drake May is slipping a little bit? Why do you think that is? Because when you come on with us, you've <laughs> called Drake May games, and, and mm-hmm. you think highly of Drake May as a quarterback, but it's like some people don't think that highly of him, and now yeah. you see a J.J. McCarthy sort of slipping in that spot that yeah. that before then was reserved for Drake May. Yeah. It's a great question. It's a great question. Look, I think everybody is going to um you know evaluate quarterbacks and have a certain opinion about guys. Like I and I'm gonna use I'll use this example because it's a Michigan State guy. Look, yeah. I loved Kirk Cousins coming out of college. I thought he was awesome because I, I watched him play games at Michigan State in cold, nasty weather and still pass the ball really well. Like, we we had joked before about the talent around him at receiver when he was there. Like, I loved Kirk Cousins. Well, like, think about it. Washington got beat up because they took him in the fourth round after they had taken RG3 with the second overall pick. Like, not everyone's going to see quarterbacks the same way. Like, remember, Josh Allen's the best quarterback in his class. I mean, he wasn't the first one taken. You know, mm-hmm. like, that's that happens. Patrick Mahomes? the best quarterback in his class. He wasn't the first one taken in his class. And so like, why is it like that? Look, people are going to see different things. People are going to, um, you know, maybe, maybe value, value certain traits more than others. Um, I would just say this. I, and I've said this, like, and I'm not like waiting to, for someone else to say something to copy what they say. I think he's as good of a prospect as I've evaluated. Like I, like that's how I feel about Drake May. I think he checks every single box. Uh, about as, as well as you can in terms of playing that position. Now, is McCarthy a good prospect? Yeah, of course he is. Like, look, if, if you're a battle-tested guy, which he was at Michigan, had to fight for that job and win that job at a program like that, like, there's something to you, you know, if it wasn't just a, a handed-to-you scenario and you had to fight for it. He's a, he's, I actually think he's an excellent runner with the football. I, I think he's a good competitive guy that's played big in big moments. That's, that's a big deal. Just for perspective, he's got like, I don't know, I think he's got like under 600, you know, attempts in his career in college. By contrast, you look at some other guys, they got like 1,500 attempts. I think there's a big unknown about what he is as a passer, even though he's played a good amount of college football because of the offense at Michigan. Yeah, and that's what. Oh, sorry, d Go ahead. 
No, no, no. I, I was going to say that's what Caroline and I were talking about in, in regards to J.J. McCarthy. Like, all of a sudden, you know, he comes out of – it's not like he comes out of nowhere, but I think from what I've seen – on 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 television and on film and watching Michigan a lot, he's a good quarterback. But to go from where he was before, you know, draft talk or right after the national championship to where he's at now, I mean, goodness gracious, they must have saw some things on tape that they really loved them. Because the way they're approaching it, it's like teams are, you know, sort of trying to jockey to move up to get JJ McCarthy. Yeah, and listen, it all might be fake. It all might be mm-hmm. like, oh, my gosh, Drake May's amazing. Let's make sure everyone knows that, like, yeah, he's got this long delivery. We don't like that. Oh, like, yeah, we're not, he's kind of stiff. His interview was, yeah, it was just okay. Like, like it might be that, too. Like, I'm just – I'm like, Daniel Jones got drafted really hot. Shocked me. Mm-hmm. I, I, I thought he was just okay. Like, I, I did not think that he should have been drafted in the first round. I did not think he was great. I, I think I've told you guys this before. Yeah, I talked to a guy that I, you know, feel like I'm close with. And he basically was like, you know, Daniel Jones. We had a conversation about him. I'm like, there's no shot the Giants are taking Daniel Jones. Like, there's no way that it's happening. And they move up and take him. And it was like, hold on a second, man. Like, you hurt my feelings. Like, I thought we were boys. <laughs> you told me how much, you know, like you agree with my take on, on Daniel Jones. And next thing you know, you all move up and get them. Like, so I think it's that time too. So, look, I'm not saying I know what the rumor is or what anybody else is doing. I just I don't think that there's any possible way. As, as much time as I spent around Drake May, as much football as I've watched him play, what I think his growth potential is at the position and all that stuff, there's no shot that I'm the only guy that thinks he's the best quarterback in this class. There's no way. Like, it's just I, – I don't see how that could be possible based on how – I mean, how good I, I think of a prospect he is. Talking with ESPN NFL analyst Tim Hasselbeck, will a team like a Minnesota or a Denver or the Raiders or the Saints, a quarterback needy team, would they trade up? Would they talk themselves into trading up to either four with Arizona or five with the Chargers or even seven with the Titans to take J.J. McCarthy? Yeah, uh, I mean, I forget. I think Mike Tannenbaum put together a scenario where Arizona moved Kyler Murray to Minnesota and took JJ oh. McCarthy. And um, okay, Minnesota needs a quarterback. You know, I mean, like that is. I, I don't think there's any shot they're going into the season with their current roster. And and I think it's important when you lose a good player or that you replace them with a good player. They lost a really good player. So, and, you know, and on the Kyler Murray front, you know, I, I think Kyler, like, had a pretty good year coming off of an injury. So, and, and Kyler's contract in a few years is going to look like a bargain if he's playing at a starter level because of what's happening with these other quarterback contracts. So, yeah, I do think that there will be some type of movement. I think a team like Minnesota, certainly a team that has some ammunition in terms of draft capital, definitely could be in the, the mix for something like that. Um, wait. Go ahead, Demas. Um, quickly, I want to ask you, uh, Kansas City. Um, obviously, we know uh, what's going on with Rasheed Rice, and it seems like more stuff is 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 coming out. Um, and mm-hmm. the way I look at it, I don't see how he gets away without being without not being suspended. So, mm-hmm. if I assume he's going to be suspended for a considerable amount of time, what do what does um, the Kansas City Chiefs do in regards to the to the draft? Because now. They're taking yeah. their best pass catcher um, of outside yeah. of Travis Kelsey. He may mm-hmm. not be available available for them some portion of the season. Yeah, I think the thing that's really hard for the Chiefs. I mean, obviously, it's just a bad situation in terms of exactly, just, you know, growing up responsibility here. But like from a from a standpoint of if you look at Kansas City's receiving core, the only one that really showed um, progress and improvement throughout the year really was Rasheed Rice. 
And they definitely started relying on him more and more. Was he perfect? No, but he was the, really the only ascending player. You go back to, and obviously they've made moves on this, but like Marquez Valdez Scantling, he had a bad year. He had a really bad year. Now, he made one really big catch in the postseason, but he wasn't an ascending player in terms of improving in their system throughout the year. Obviously, Kadarius Tony didn't do that. So, like, Sky Moore, uh, you know, has not come along the way that they wanted him to. Rasheed Rice is the only guy that has. And now, to your point, now you're not going to have him most likely, and for at least for some period of time. So with that being the case, like, yeah, I think you now are in the mix of, like, where are you drafting a wide receiver? How soon, especially with it being – and how often with it being a receiver class that I think most people think is really good. And I would agree with that. Look, Zay Flowers is a good player when was the first – I don't know, whatever, first couple of receivers taken last year. Like, that would not be the case in this class. Like, I think in this class, there's, uh, you know, there are probably four, four, five, six receivers that maybe would go before Zay Flowers would have gone. And, you know, if we look back at last year's class. Talking with Tim Hasselbeck. Tim, it's kind of become a running joke on the show that every single mock draft that comes out, and it doesn't matter where it comes from, whether it's the athletic or your colleagues at ESPN or NFL Network, every single one has the Titans taking Joe Alt at seven. It's yep. almost more newsworthy when there's a mock draft that doesn't have the Titans taking yep. Joe Alt at seven. Is he the tackle prospect that everyone makes him out to be, that he is pro-ready, that he is plug-and-play and has the potential to be your left tackle for the next 10 to 15 years? Yeah, I would say this, and this is from experience calling um, a few Notre Dame games over the last few years. You know, whether it was the Eichenberg guy, you know, uh, whether it was, you know, whether it's all, whether it's, you know, just guys that, that come out of that program. Look, there are certain places where, you know, it's it feels like five-star after five-star, um, you know, big, tall, long, athletic, recruited by everybody because it's Notre Dame. They recruit the country. They have a history of getting good offensive linemen. They play against good competition week in and week out. Um, and so you get to see it. And I remember talking to Brian Kelly about it because they had a bunch of injuries one year. And he looked at me and he's like, honestly, it's not that big of a deal when like we look like we've, we've got another one right behind them. And so, okay. What have there been guys that have come out of there and not been as good as, you know, people expected them to be sure. Uh, I think there are a lot of guys that have come out of that program playing on the offensive line that, there's just been so many data points from the time that they're in high school through what they did in college that you have um, fairly good authority that, you know, they should be able to compete at a high level. And it makes sense for a team that's got a needed offensive line has filled um, some needs at receiver and needs and defensive back that it kind of feels like, yeah, this is scripted to take an offensive lineman. And as far as the offensive line is concerned, because it really, the more that we talk about it, the more and more I feel like the Titans have to go offensive line early in the draft. But whenever we talk about a lot of the tackles in this draft, whether it's Alt or Ola Fashnu or JC Latham, I, there's varying opinions on how close those tackles are in talent, how closely they might be evaluated. What do you believe is the drop off between alt and yeah. some of these other first round graded tackles? Yeah, here's what I say, and this is just like you know, for what I do. Look, I look at the quarterbacks and evaluate the quarterbacks. And the processes of me looking at the quarterbacks, I end up seeing receivers, right? Like that's something that like whether it was when I was looking at Trevor Lawrence and I was looking at uh that and like you see the receivers that he plays with. Uh, you know, similar thing with, with Michael Penix and, and Roma Dunze. Like like you see that. Yeah. I I'm not a I'm not a tackle expert. I'm not a defensive line expert. Now I will say, like, there are times you recognize certain things. I remember watching Blake Bortles and in the process of watching Blake Bortles, like Jadavian Clowney was impossible not to realize like what was going on and the impact that he was, he was having. So like, I don't know the difference, um, you know, and I don't, I don't pretend to know the difference, you know, in regards to that. And I think that ultimately when you look at a need and then you think of what you want, I think on all the prospects in my experience with, with offensive linemen is, okay, what is the ceiling and what is the floor? And the reason I say that is this, you know, everyone wants to say, like, oh, hey, this is the next Jonathan Ogden. Well, guess what? They're not. 
because there's been one Jonathan Ogden. There have been very few players like that. The question is, is who's no worse than Jeff Backus? They're like, well, who's Jeff Backus? They're like, who was a first-round <laughs> offensive tackle from, the Michi- from Michigan who was a starter for a decade? Well, like, okay, who's Jeff Backus? Who's Anthony Costanzo? Who's the – like, who's that guy? Like, I need the ceiling and I need the floor. And I think that's what you're really looking at when you're talking about offensive line. Last one for you, Tim, quickly. You said when you're evaluating the quarterbacks, you also kind of by de facto evaluate the receivers as well. How do you rank these top three receivers? Neighbors, Adunze, Harrison. Yeah, I think Harrison – is the guy that I would want the most. Receiver is a big bust position. You know, we we get it wrong a lot. And I just think that there's there's too many things about how he's been coached, um, you know, what he looks like running routes, how he plays the football, that I would feel confident that, like, he's not out of the league in four years. Like, that, like I'm, and, you know, that isn't necessarily swinging for the fences, but, like, I feel most confident about that. Um, I then would say that neighbors – uh, would be the next guy for me because I just think that like when I see him get off of like one one way guys are bad is if they can't get off the jam like he to me is a guy that he's not going to have a problem developing really good releases and then Adunze and I certainly like having him ranked third I mean I don't think he's a good player like I think he's a great player I love his story I love his attitude I love how big and strong he is but that's how I would rank those guys Tim, you are the best. Appreciate your time today. Thanks for being flexible with us this week, and we'll catch up with you next week. Have a great weekend. Sounds good. See you guys. All right, have a good one, Tim. Appreciate it. Tim Hasselbeck, he is the absolute best. We'll react to what what Tim had to say there. Plus, Final Four, both on the men's and women's side this upcoming weekend. I don't know what it is. It just feels like there's not as much juice, in my opinion, going into the Final Four than there was in the Elite Eight. I don't know what that is. Am I alone? Mace, we are brought to you by Zen Sports. Start earning cash rewards on your bets today. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-889-9789.
Hey, tune in to 102.5 and 106.3 The Game today as Vanderbilt Baseball takes on LSU with pregame at 6.45 p.m. And first pitch at 7 p.m. I'm bummed that Willie's not here because he didn't get to give him a hard time for Mike Tigers beating down his doors last night. A Vanderbilt Baseball brought to you by Smoky Mountain Tops. Your countertop experts visit SmokyMountainTops.com. The Final Four coming up this weekend. Women's Final Four tonight. We've got NC State and South Carolina. UConn, Iowa. Little Paige Becker's Caitlin Clark action. We've got the Men's Final Four on Saturday. I'm going to be honest with you, D-Mace. I don't know what it is on the men's side. I don't know if it's like the Vols got bounced in the Elite Eight. I don't know if it's... I don't know what it is. I'm not feeling the juice for the men's final four. Like I was so excited. It was appointment Mm -hmm. watching for me every elite eight game, but now I'm just kind of like, yeah. And I don't know why. Like it's the final freaking (laughs) four. Well, because I mean, listen, we only, we only have two of the final two of the, you know, number one seeds that, that made it through. Um, obviously, um, Houston got beat earlier. Carolina got beat as well. They were another number one seed. Um, so now you look at this, this you know, fantastic story of um, DJ Burns and the North Carolina State uh, team going yeah. a, up against this Purdue team led by Zach Eady. The big um, men of all big men. The big men of all big men. And then you got Alabama, who's a four seed, going up against that UConn team, which seems unbeatable. Wagon. Um, you know, so I, I think people they've only UConn has only trailed in this in this year's tournament five minutes. They trailed only five minutes, That's which means so they true. basically have been dominating yeah. everybody that they played, sort of like last year. They dominated everybody that they played last year. Um, they got on a roll and they just you know they just took over in the in, in, in the tournament. And it seems like quietly they are doing the same thing Uh, but you don't have sort of the marquee names Mm -hmm. that are attached with these teams even though these are four really good teams and we you know we were able to see Alabama firsthand um, being in the SEC this is a damn good team but you know are they going to be able to match you know, um, UConn and 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 what they're able to do, especially in the middle with their big center, um, and then Purdue in their center. Can Purdue finally get over the hump and make it to the championship game with who we believe is going to be the back-to-back Player of the Year, Zach Eady? Um, but you just don't have the sexy names out there. But if you look at the women's side. I mean, you got just this star stud everywhere, mm-hmm. uh, whether it be Cardoza, the big center from South Carolina, Paige Becker, Caitlin Clark. I mean, you have stardom everywhere across the board when you're talking about um, these four teams on the women's side. And that might be what it is mm-hmm. that, that, you know, superstars and headlines and storylines that drives so much interest. I think we've seen over the past couple of years that the women's game is incentivized because they stick around a little bit longer traditionally than the men will. There's a lot of one and dones on the men's side. Mm -hmm. When you were there for a year, you don't develop those rivalries like we've seen develop between Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese in Iowa and LSU. Whenever you're only there for one year, you don't really get to fall in love with the person and the personality and the character like everyone across America has been able to fall in love with Caitlin Clark. So I think that's part of it for me. But I mean, you still have the the names and the storylines with DJ Burns against Zach Eady. Like if there's anyone that could beat Zach Eady, there is anyone that could do to Zach Eady what Zach Eady has done to literally any other team in the country. Like it's DJ Burns and NC State. I, I wholeheartedly believe that. Um so and it might be like once it gets closer, when I wake up tomorrow morning and we've got two great games on, like then I'm going to start feeling it. But I will say this, as far mm-hmm. as Alabama is concerned, like if you would have asked me, you know, like to place odds on the Caroline Fenton Sportsbook, will Alabama make the final four? Yes, would be like plus 25 billion. Um, you might want to sprinkle a little <laughs> bit of money on that one. Um, but I will say, I didn't care who it was. You know, the SEC had eight, teams represented in the NCAA tournament. I didn't care if it was Tennessee 
or Auburn or Alabama or Kentucky or Texas A&M. It was time for the SEC to be represented in the Final Four because they hadn't been there since 2019. In the SEC this past season, or really over the past couple of seasons, the Mm -hmm. SEC wanted to be respected as one of the top basketball conferences in America because, frankly, that's kind of what they were, at least in the regular season. And I think that the SEC had four, five, maybe even six teams that legitimately could have made a run. But you cannot be considered one of the best basketball conferences if you consistently are getting beaten way too early in the tournament and if you aren't represented in one of the final four. So, you know, whether it was Alabama or Tennessee or Florida or whoever, I just thought it's about time that the SEC finds itself in the final four. And if it wasn't this year, when you had eight teams, when you had as many teams that were as dominant in the regular season as they were, like, it, there were just no excuses left. You needed to be in the Final Four. Would I have guessed that it was Alabama? N- no. But good for Alabama. <laughs> and I think that the SEC has to thank Alabama for being that team and being that represent- representation from the conference, mm-hmm. getting to the Final Four, because it's just been, it's been too long. The SEC has been too good for too long to mm-hmm. not be represented in Phoenix this season. Well, they are represented, but not by the teams that we thought was going to be representing the SEC. We thought it was yeah, going credit to, to be Nate Oates for that. Kentucky. Exactly. Yeah. Credit to Nate Oates. He's done a wonderful job um, led by the guard C- um, um, Sears. But we didn't expect, you know, Alabama to be in this situation. We expected someone like a Tennessee or a Kentucky or an Auburn to be in this situation. Well, you know, Alabama said, you know what? Damn, y'all. <laughs> we're going to keep on playing and we're going to keep on winning. But it's going to be an interesting matchup uh, with UConn in this one. But they are, I mean, kudos to them. They are the team that is representing the SEC in the Final Four. Um, and, you know, to I would have loved to see Tennessee in the Final Four, but to have some type of representation, because you're right, if they didn't have any representation whatsoever in the Final Four, after the season that the SEC had in basketball, I think it, it would have looked bad on a conference, period. You want to be the best, you got to beat the best. Exactly. Absolutely. So, but we'll see some good games. We'll see some good games this weekend. I can't wait to see, you know, and, and, and I'm sure everybody's talking about that. They talked about it on, on ESPN earlier this morning. I was watching Kaylin Clark, Paige, um, you know, those two individuals going up, you got two of, of the best uh, women's college players in the country. Um, and, and what makes this not just int- intriguing, but exciting, they would have, to, they more than likely would guard each other. You know, mm-hmm. if you looked at last week, when you had connect versus Zach Eady, connect was never going to guard Zach Eady and Zach right. Eady was never going to guard connect. But in this situation, or you go back to Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese, Angel Reese was never going to guard Caitlin Clark. And if Caitlin Clark found herself guarding Angel Reese, she wasn't going to win. If Angel Reese found herself guarding uh, Caitlin Clark, she wasn't going to win. If Caitlin now Clark you was get guarding two Angel Reese, players. Lisa Bluter should have been fired. Exactly. Got to I, absolutely. Guard anybody. <laughs> Put the ball in her hand. Absolutely. So Ooh. now you get to see two marquee players guard one another. Now they won't be guarding one another throughout the game because you don't want them to get in foul trouble. But they there will be several times down the court where you will see Paige go up against Caitlin. What are you on the men's side? Like, what is your buy-in excitement level? Um, one, I, I, I do want to see it's it's sort of this David and Goliath mm-hmm. with North Carolina State and Purdue. You got you know Zach Eady at seven foot four going up against DJ Burns at six foot ten. It looks like you have you ever seen the movie? Uh, what was it called? Big with Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. uh-huh. and. Um, uh, Joe Pe- not Joe Pesci, but um, I forgot the other actor. And when they were on the press release, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger is like eight feet tall and the other guy is like two feet tall. Like itty bitty. That's how it's going. Exactly. That's how it's going to seem when you see DJ Burns try to guard Zach Eady or, you know, Zach Eady trying to guard DJ Moore because DJ Burns, because my thing is DJ Burns has the ability to pull him away from the basket. 
Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody else that has played Purdue thus far in the tournament had the ability to have their center pull Zach Eady from the middle. Will he go? I don't know. But if DJ Burns hits enough mid-range shots, that forces Zach Eady to move out the middle of the field, middle of the court, where he's been dominant on the defensive end as well as the offensive end. So I'm intrigued just to see that matchup. Again, you got the David in 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 you know North Carolina State, and then you got the, the Goliath in Purdue. Um, so I'm eager to see that matchup. And they both have their own Goliaths, respectively. Yeah. They have their own <laughs> massive big men. And traditionally, I when it comes to you know like Cinderellas and the Cinderella stories in March, I love uh-huh. it in the first couple of rounds. But once we get to the Elite Eight, I'm like, no, like give me the blue bloods, give me the best teams. Mm-hmm. This story was great and all. Like when St. Peter's found themselves in the Elite Eight. I was like, I'm tired of you now. Like, you were a great story last week, two weeks ago. <laughs> you can go. Go away now, please. I, I want to see the big boys play. Um, why I feel differently about NC State is they have that character in DJ Burns. They have that mm-hmm. player that I think all of America has fallen in love with and everyone has kind of gotten on board with. And I think that Zach Eady may have kind of become that villain. Like how when we look on the women's side, the Angel Reese versus Caitlin Clark rivalry, Caitlin Clark is the hero and Angel Reese is viewed as the villain. Although I, it's kind of a storyline that frustrates me. It's a storyline that drives exactly. eyeballs. That's the same kind mm-hmm. of thing that I think all of America, Vols fans included, are sick and tired of Zach Eady. And DJ Burns is like this beacon of hope, like, oh, that has come out of nowhere. Now everyone is is really championing for NC State. So I like I think that's a, a fun storyline as well. Yeah, and 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 I, and I look at it from the standpoint. It's not just um, you know sticking with uh, um, the Purdue game versus North Carolina State. It's not just DJ Burns. It's DJ DJ Holmes who's shooting forty percent for the three point line. Who shot forty percent from the three point three point line during the season. He averages, um, you know, close to, if not 17 points a game um, during the season. I don't know how much he's averaging. Um, You know, he's still averaging double digits in the, in the tournament. So it's not just a DJ Burns. It's it's like, okay, you got Zach Eady on one side, you got DJ Burns on the other, who are going to be the other guys that sort of, you know, make a name for themselves in the final four, because that's what it's going to boil down to. I mean, DJ Burns has a name. We know he can play. Yeah. We know damn well Zach Eady can play. Who's going to be those other guys that contributes to whether Purdue wins or loses or whether North Carolina State wins or loses? Do you feel like this weekend is appointment watching for sports fans? Appointment watching? I don't think I would have said this any other year um, outside of this year. But because of how the women's is playing, how the women's teams are playing in this tournament, the marquee names and how they're not just marquee names, they're balling. Like Paige is balling. Caitlin is balling. You know, that South Carolina team is balling. I wouldn't have said it was appointment watching this year. But because they are, it is appointment watching, and it's all because of the women's basketball. It's all because of the women's um, Final Four. It's not just the Final Four. If Just think, when they play the finals, the championship game, that's going to be highly rated as well because you're still going to have either Paige in it or Caitlin in it. So one of, now if Caitlin's in it, I think it's going to be the 12.3 that they got last week versus LSU viewership. I hope it does. Yeah, but because of the marquee names, I think I would I think I believe it's appointment watching this this weekend just because of the women's final four. If it was left up to the men's final four, it would be like, "Nah, I I catch a replay. Just yeah. tell me the score and who scored what." But because of the women and the way they're playing, it is appointment watching basketball, especially tonight. I'm with you. And I think that the women's tournament is must watch. It is appointment watch. Exactly. I think Iowa LSU was. And I mean, like, obviously, I'm going to watch it because that is my team uh-huh. and my alma mater. But I mean, 
12 and a half million other people agreed with me. And not all of those people are Iowa or LSU alum. So yeah, I'm going to watch all the games. Of course, I'm going to watch the women's games tonight. And I'm going to watch the men's games on Saturday, but the excitement level and the sense of urgency level for me to watch Alabama UConn as great of a game as that's going to be, because there's probably going to be about 275 total points scored in that game. The way we're actually sitting down watching it, we're going to love it. But the hype, the buildup, it just feels so much more intriguing on the women's side than it does on the men's. We're going to take it to the bank. Coming up next, <laughs> Caroline, Willie, D. Mays. And speaking of the final four, go to the game Nashville.com slash bracket challenge and fill out your four team bracket to compete to win prizes, including tickets to see Creed at Ascend Amphitheater on August 13th. The 1025 The Game Bracket Challenge brought to you by ESPN Bet Sportsbook. Twin Peaks and Volunteer Hose and Gasket.
to take it to the bank with FNM Bank. Less worry, more living. FNM Bank, making lives better by making thinking easier. So visit one of their 20 locations throughout Middle Tennessee and Southern Kentucky or online at myfmbank.com. Before we take it to the bank this week, quickly, Nick, how did we do last week? Yes, so last week, Caroline picked Gonzaga to win over Purdue. That did not happen. Did not she happen. did take... Tennessee to beat Creighton, and that did happen. That did not happen. Oh, oh, Creighton. Yeah, I think Creighton. the most beat Creighton? Yeah, Creighton. Oh, cool. All yeah. right. And then you had a Mookie Betts oh, wow. home run. <laughs> that did happen. And that did happen Several as well. Several of those happened. So that was pretty good. You had a seven on the weekend. Um, as for Willie, he picked right. Marquette to, uh, minus seven and a half over uh, NC State. That did not happen. He picked Tennessee to win. That happened. Gave him a five. Uh, and then D-Mace picked Duke to win. That did happen. He picked South Carolina to win uh, over Indiana by 20-plus points. They only won by four. And then he had the Detroit no. Tigers to have two home runs on opening day. That did not happen. So D-Mace with a three. As for myself, I picked Ronald Acuna Jr. Jr. to get a home run. Didn't happen. And then I went against the grain and said the Dodgers were going to sweep the Cardinals. That didn't happen either. So the current standings after the second week of Take It to the Bank, Willie at the top with 15, Caroline in All second right. with 12, uh, myself at 10 in the third spot, and D-Mace down at the bottom with three. So D-Mace, let's turn it around this week, man. You got this. Damn. Three I can't even be mad. That's all I got? Yeah. I can't even wow. be mad. First week was a goose me, egg. So Willie's been so down right. bad and Take It to the Bank. Yeah. As right. with that, picking, go I'm ahead, picking, D-Mace. I'm picking the Nashville Predators. Ooh. To win, um, two or they will have two or more goals. Um, I'm taking UConn um, to win by more than ten points, ten points or more. Um, UConn's men, not UConn's women. And then I'm picking outright UConn's women to win and Paige Beckers to have over fifteen points. Ooh, okay, I like it. Go ahead, Caroline. All right, I'm gonna t- I'm gonna say that the Cinderella story ends here. I'm gonna take Purdue over NC State. I am gonna say that Caitlin Clark has 30 plus points against UConn, and I'm gonna say South Carolina not only beats NC State, but South Carolina has a perfect undefeated season and wins the national championship. Whoa. Okay. When is the national championship? Monday. Sunday, and then the Tuesday? men's is Monday. Sunday. Oh, so it's Sunday. Okay. Huh. Okay. Right. Well, as for Willie's pick, he sent him in before he left. UConn to win and cover the 11 and a half. Purdue to win and cover the eight and a half. And he went with a bets pick as usual. Pete Alonzo, home run versus the Reds in the series over the weekend. So not just one game, but for this series. And as for myself, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm going to take... I don't know why, but Nolan Arenado to to hit a home run. This guy's been in a slump. He's due for a home run. Over the weekend, it's going to happen. And, uh, yeah, I'll take the Preds to win and score three or more goals. So that's it. You are an optimistic Cardinals fan. Uh, Much more optimistic Mm -hmm. than myself, Nick. But I like it, and I I hope that you are right. And that is going to do it for us today. We will be back Monday at 11 a.m. Jared's first mock draft at 3.30 Stillman and Company is up next. Be love and love on your people. Have a great weekend and peace.